Hey, hey, YouTube, what's happening? Welcome to Gas Mass and Hand Grenades. I'm your host, Metal Madness Jeff. Today, I'm joined by an artist that I've been a fan of since the early 90s, which essentially dates both of us, I fear. Uh, when he burst onto the alternative metal scene with the eclectic band Saigon Kick, for which he was the guitarist, uh, co-vocalist, and primary songwriter, Saigon Kick had a massive blockbuster radio ballad called Love Is On The Way, in 1992, and they released five albums. However, he also was the frontman guitarist in pop punk band Super Transatlantic. He co-owned his own record label along with his brother called Beeler Brothers Records and has released three solo albums and numerous EPs, like 5,000 or so EPs, I think it is, under his, I'm kidding, that's not true, under his own name and more recently under the Baron Von Bielski Orchestra moniker, Please welcome my guest, Jason Beeler. What's happening, dude? How are you, my friend? How are you? We've had a little chat backstage, so we kind of know what's up there. First of all, I want to thank you very much for joining me on Gas Mask and Hand Grenades. Um, this kind of happened fairly quickly, and I didn't really expect it to. I thought, I'll send him a, an Insta. How it came about was I, came, I ran across the uh, Songs for the Apocalypse uh, album on youtube i don't own it it's on order i probably won't get it till after christmas you know that's how that works but when it came out there was just so much going on you, because that came out right in the heart of the pandemic and you know i had lost my job so i couldn't really go blowing money on a lot of stuff so i don't have it and i apologize for that but i've listened to it incessantly for the last couple of days and it's yeah it's a fucking brilliant album but I thought, you know what? I'm going to reach out. I see he's on Instagram. He's never going to respond to me. There's no way. And I sent you a, a DM. And for about three or four days, I kind of tracked what was going on. I'm like, oh, he's on. But yeah, he didn't answer. Yeah, he's not answering. And then out of nowhere, it's like, sure, I'd be happy to. I'm like, nah, it's got to be an imposter. It's got to be. <laughs> so here you are. So how well, you, you know doing, what happens man? is like It's like when you get DMs on Instagram, I'm not sure if everybody's is the same as mine, but like it goes in different folders. Mm. So like you, you get like a primary, a general, and like a request tab. So no, I don't have I don't, that. It just goes straight into my inbox. Weirdly, it does. Like I have three. So you know. Oh, oh, you're saying if it's yeah, I know. Okay, yes, I do know what you're talking about. Never mind. Yeah, right. So that's why I kind of see stuff and then I, I try to get back to it if I can. But so every once in a while, I just make sure I'm not missing anything. So sometimes it takes me a bit to get to the. No problem, man. You were, I mean, you were pretty sharp back on it. And as I said, a little bit of a surprise, but a pleasant surprise for sure. So um, we were just talking, it's snowing here in central Pennsylvania. I'm up above Philly about an hour Northwest. Of, I'm in the heart of the Amish country. If you're familiar with that. Absolutely. Lancaster, Pennsylvania is where I'm at. And um, it's snowing and pretty cold, but it's going to get a lot colder apparently, which I'm not, I'm kind of dreading. So uh, we're going to get into this, man. And um, I think I want to take you back to when you said you were a fully formed child right out of the womb, which is really interesting. But yes. we'll we'll address that at some other point in the future. Sure. Tell me a little bit about your first memories of music and how that early exposure to music affected you, like on an emotional or physical level. And by that, what, what I guess I'm getting at with that is my very first memory of music was when my father played Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, that dun-dun-dun-dun, you know. So why do I look like this, right? You know, it's, it's that's what happens, right? But, you know, I have very early memories of Simon and Garfunkel Bridge Over Troubled Water and Carol King Tapestry, uh, you know, James Taylor, Sweet Baby James. And you're just a year or two younger than me, so I know you've got to know all those names and, and probably yeah, yeah. have some similar touchstones. So tell me what, tell me if there's, you know, what happened? What? Why did you turn out like this, Jason? Well, a lot of people want the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> my wife included. I was just going to say. I... But uh, I mean, I, my earliest memories are just like driving around in New York, you know, AM gold on the radio. Mm. That So those songs, um, my parents didn't have a massive eight track collection, but they did have some eight tracks. So I, I, I believe they had like Meet the Beatles and like the fifth dimension and like all this kind of really cool stuff that I would just hear. And I mean, I just remember feeling like um, music was a language that I just understood. Like it made sense to me and, and, uh, and it was 
you know, all the things it's supposed to do, I guess, to everybody, like, you know, comfort, whatever. I mean, I just felt great when I heard it. It emotionally triggered stuff. When I hear mm -hmm. a great melody, I would, I would, well, you know, I just, it just touched me in a way that I think, you know, it probably touches a lot of people. And um, so those are my earliest memories. I mean, Barry Manilow songs, uh, Donnie and Marie show, um, the Philip Wilson show, like just anything that oh, had like right. music. Totally show and Dawn. Remember that? Yeah. You know, absolutely. And, the, you know, uh, all that share, Sonny and share, whatever oh, yeah. those things were, like not even being old enough at the time to really process what, but I just love music and hearing them. You know, I got you, babe, or whatever it was. Like those songs were cool. High like, yellow ribbon, or you know, Tony, I mean, Tony Orlando and Don, man, all the way. And people don't know that aren't our age. They don't. I mean, kids today have what is it? The the Simon Cowell show. I don't even know what it's called. American Idol, I guess, or whatever. I mean, they have that kind of stuff. It's not the same, man. It's just not the same. I'm not okay. denigrating their talent. I'm not, de but it's all about the the visual and the whole, it just doesn't feel real. That seemed real. Now, whether it was or whether they were lip syncing, I don't think they were back then. I don't think they had that technology yet, but. Well, I, mean, I guess everything is of its time. So, I mean, I'm sure. not one of those guys who like, oh, today sucks. And when I was a guy, it was great. It's, it is different though. And I mean, I think one of the, I'm friends with a couple of guys that played in the NHL, for example. And one of the things we always talk about is like, when I was a kid, all I had to do was go home and like, play music or guitar. That was it. I yeah. couldn't play Call of Duty. I couldn't play Fortnite. I couldn't go on. There wasn't exactly. 500,000 TV shows. And they used to say that was the same thing. Like all we had to yeah. do was get home and shoot pucks. Like that was it. Yeah. That was yeah. our whole life. And they don't know that they would have been as good growing up in the world we're in now because there's just so many things happening that are all worthy. Too much of information it. coming at you. So, you know, but I mean, does that necessarily mean things are worse? I, I, I don't know if it's worse or better, but I mean, I'm glad I grew up when I did. Um, and I'm glad, like, even just little things, like, you know, everybody now learns on YouTube. Right. You know, I had to sit there with a record player. Yeah. I was lucky enough to have the record or borrow it from somebody and, like, drop the needle on a riff. Yep. And then hear it with my ear and go, like, what is that? And then take it to the guitar and, like, try to figure that out and then go back and forth. And it was a tedious, painstaking process. But yeah. you develop your ear. Yeah. Not your eye. You know what I mean? Like I didn't watch the yep. riff. My brain had to process it differently than maybe someone who's, you know, but it's kind of cool at the same that, time. I was going to say that's an instance where it's actually better because you can move a lot quicker and digest a lot quicker and get stuff down a lot quicker. Whereas back then it was, like you said, it was a process to learn. Do you feel like we do? You know, if you could get the whole way through it. But I don't, I don't know that it is better in that sense because you're relying on different skill sets. When, when I was coming up, I mean, you had to use your brain and your ear to hear. Sure, you develop that, your ear. De that develops a musicality. Yes. Like you, you start to understand what that language was. And, you know, now it's like it's like kind of a, uh, you know, you see it done and it's given to you right away. So it doesn't go into your brain as deeply or in the same way. I agree. Um, yeah. So if, I, don't know, if will, I mean, we'll see how it all plays out. But I'm, that's a fair point, though. You, you're saying you're using a different set of a, a skill set that's a little bit different. Whereas back then you had to really focus. Well, it's the age old thing now. You know, vinyls made this big comeback recently, but for 20 years it had pretty much disappeared. I was part of that, man. I went CD. Awesome. Portable. Killer. Sold all my vinyl. Much to my chagrin. I did most of it. You know, all my original Yes albums, all my original Rush albums, all that right. stuff. And it's like, what? why did I do that? You know, for convenience, basically. I love it now, man. I mean, I, I hate to say it like, you know, I hated listening to vinyl. I mean, it was a pain in the ass. And like, especially from a learning standpoint or like the fact that I can sit in a car and have every song ever recorded in history in my hand <laughs> to me is a technological amazement. Um, I don't, don't, you, don't you think it made for me. And I agree with you to a large extent because I'm far enough away from the vinyl thing now for the most part that I, I remember what it was like. And I, you know, and then going through the cassette thing where it was like, oh, and, you know, going back, that's the crazy thing. The cassette thing's coming back and I don't get it at all. But, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving. I, I mean, I, I, I was a fan of the CD. I like I, I thought they Me? sounded, you know, but people swear, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I think there was a, you know, a Raymond episode or something where he bought like his dad all the jazz 
records he loved as a guy, as a kid growing up on CD. And the process was the, <laughs> that's what he loved. It, it, yeah. it, the way it sounded when you come up with it is that's what touches you. And that's what, in, you know, imprints itself on your, on your being. And that will it, better sounding doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have that same meaning to you. So I guess it all depends on where you fell in the, in the technological uh, advance. Yeah, I sometimes wonder about these audiophile guys that, you know, and I'm not one that talk like, oh, if it's a 200 gram vinyl with, you know, mastered at 45 speed stuff. My ears are so fried from loud amps, playing in bands, going to shows and not using ear protection. I can't tell the difference in that shit. I My guess. favorite audiophile discussion was like, we uh, at our studio, we own an Eve console, like this legendary Eve console. Yeah. It was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And the guy that used to work on it was from Scotland had a great thick accent and he was actually rewiring parts of it for us. Cause it was, you know, anything with a vintage console, it's like you're chasing gremlins all day long, like exactly. down the, down the line. So he's working on it. And some salesman came in with this like fiber optic audio cable. Like it's like a thousand dollars every six inches to run from the power amps to the, to the speakers. And he's going through his spiel. And eventually the, the Neve tech had had enough. He's like, you know, what are you talking about? This whole console is wired with the cheapest phone cable possible. <laughs> and yet it gives that incredible sound, it's just, right? You know, it's, it's all this like, you know, like literally like phone cable, like the cheapest wire they could find because, you know, so yeah, run fiber optic from the back of it to the speaker is going to change. It's like, you know, it's just, he just thought it was the most idiotic thing ever, you know, and voodoo. I can't hear past that stuff. So voodoo science, I think a lot of it is. I mean, there if are- you, If you feel better- Maybe you play better, I guess. If you think I mean, something's happening. Would you agree, though, there are some things. For example, guitars. The more you pay, generally, you get a better instrument. Generally, not always, but generally. I mean, uh, a high-end Martin D45 versus a an entry-level Triple O or something like that. There, I feel there's a difference. I, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's craft and art in anything. Right. I mean, I, I always, you know, I'm not one of those guitar collector guys. I mean, I do have a, a, a Martin that I love. Mm-hmm. What do you uh, have, a D35? Yeah. That's what I thought. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Great. I love that guitar. But um, I'm a, I'm a tool guy. Like, I, I don't want my saws to be diamond coated no. and, you know, with all these bindings. That, like, I, I want to feel like I can knock it over and pick it up. And, you know, I, I'm not into furniture guitars. Yeah. Or right. I'm not into the new wave of, like, you know, hedge fund guys buying Les Pauls for $45,000. Because it's got like barracuda scales embedded in the whatever, dude. I just want something that's gonna play great and sound. You're right. like you're like Stephen Wilson. I would talk to him about guitar stuff. And he'd be like, "Dude, I don't, I don't collect them. I don't care. Yeah, this PRS is great. It's gold. It it's a gold color one. It's awesome." I'm yeah. like, "Okay, they're tools to him. They're like pens. That's what he he said. If I was a writer, it's like a pen for me. If they stay in tune really well, they're intonated great." You know, you can get into the micro. But the funny thing is, at least for me, like no matter what gear I buy, and I've gotten excited about a lot of different things throughout the years. Mm -hmm. different. I mean, it's just frustrating how much I wind up sounding exactly like me. You <laughs> well, know? that's what is it? It's in the hands. Eddie, why was Eddie so good? It's in the hands. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah. he, he was going to sound like Eddie on a PV. I mean, yep. maybe a little bit better on his Marshalls, but he always sounded like Eddie Van Halen. Jeff yeah. Beck always sounds like Jeff Beck. Oh, I hell mean, yeah. And uh, that's not a bad thing. Well, speaking of that, let's segue into guitar. Is that your first instrument or did you do the piano lesson thing or what? No, I, I, my first instrument was guitar, uh, but it was an accident. I wanted to be a bass player because of Gene Simmons. Ah. Uh, and uh, my mom didn't really realize the difference between a bass and a guitar. <laughs> so she probably went to some store and said, oh, my son wants to play bass. And the guy was like, you know, you should have a guitar. You know, you, you can always go back to whatever the reasons were. So I wound up getting a guitar, but it worked out great in in, in hindsight. But uh, yeah, the bass players rarely get the chicks. So I mean, you know, you it worked out case, for you. The guitar players don't get the chicks either. In my case, I can't speak for every <laughs> guitar player. Um, now you do play keyboards, I would imagine, right? You play some uh, functionally. I mean, to, to articulate so, what I want to do, yeah. Right, and you use a lot. I would imagine with the stuff we're going to get into, you use quite a few plugins, I would assume, right? I mean, do you record yeah. there at your house or do you record at the studio or do you still have the studio at this point? I have or? all the gear from the studio that I wanted to keep. Right. Um, so yeah, I have a studio here. That's. You oh, know, you do in the, at your house then? At funk, yeah. That, that's pretty functional. At your palatial mansion. We'll get to that in a minute. At my palatial um, 
at, at the uh, the Beelerville Estates. Beelerville Estates. I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak a peek here at my uh, my next question here. Um, so when you when did you really kind of know you wanted to be a musician? Was there that eureka moment? Did it happen over time? Was it this and and, and coupling on to that? Was there really any other plan besides that? College, I don't remember. Career. I just, like I said, I, I just remember music meaning everything to me from the time I could realize I was listening to music. And right. um, so there was no like moment. I mean, there's, there's some critical things. I mean, I think I was lucky enough to go see my first concert was Ozzy on the Blizzard of Oz. Okay. Tour. I was going to ask with you Brand, that. Cool. With, with Randy Rhodes, Rudy, yeah. Zorro, Tommy Aldridge. Yeah. And I remember being like, just like looking at Randy Rhodes going, you know, that's amazing. Like that, not only was he amazing. Oh yeah. That's got to, you know, where do you apply for that job? Because that seems like, you know, I was 12 or 13 or 11. I don't remember exactly, but you know, it was life changing. So that was 81 or 82? 81. I think it was right at the very beginning of the Blizzard of Oz. So, okay. But I got to ask this question real quick. Not where was Kiss? Because you mentioned Gene Simmons. Where was Kiss in this? Because for me, that was the band right there that, you know, right. that 76 to 80, 79 really was like, that was all I knew and that was all I cared about. Was that a band that... Oh, you know, Kiss was the first records I had. So I remember okay, buying, right. like, I remember going and I don't know when, it, it, it's not necessarily upon release, but I bought Destroyer probably because of the cover. Oh, yeah. And, um, and then was just hooked and, you know, and, and bought... Alive and then Alive Two or whatever. I don't like. I didn't buy them chronologically right. the way they were released, but right. Um, and then started buying all the magazines they were in. Anything that had a magazine, I you know, I was, I was, but I never got a chance to see them then. Like back then, I was you know too little, and my, my mom was not really going to send me off to an arena show. Yeah. Have you seen them since? Uh, I saw them on the. Um, I think it was Lick It Up. And I haven't even seen the the, the 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 reunion tours yet, you know, or yet. I mean, uh, sadly, but uh, I've seen them live since then. Yeah, but not in the heyday when it meant everything to me. Sadly, um, you know, for me, it was it was alive. A buddy of mine had. I don't think I got it when it came out. I think I got it like maybe five six months after. And then it was love. It was rock and roll over. Then Love Gun. Then back to Destroyer. Right. And that was the first show I saw in 1979. And as fate would have it, literally three days before the show happened, Judas Priest was actually opening on Hellbent for Leather. Oh, and wow. they, they were off the tour right before that. I didn't know who Priest was at that time, of course. Didn't learn a Priest right. until Unleashed in the East in 79, I think that was. so. And Rush was my second show, which was oh, wow. insanely cool on the Permanent Waves tour. But I just wondered where Kiss was because we're in that same age range. Yeah, yeah. And us guys kind of know what that meant back then and what was... Oh, that was my first... I mean, when you're a little kid, especially as a little kid... Yeah. Um, I mean, I still think the songs hold up now, but... Many. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the the whole idea of, like, comic book horror, rock band, rock star, you know, like, the Beatles meets, you know, monster. It was just an amazing thing. I mean, it, just, it, it filled every entertainment need I think you could want as a young kid. Superhero slash rock star slash all that stuff. So it was just, you know, and it's, and the tunes are great. Of course there was Phantom of the, what was it called? The Phantom of the part. The, I don't know that it was really at its peak of creative, creative powers at that point, but. Uh, <laughs> well then, you know, when they came out with the solo albums is when I was like, I don't know. I mean, like Paul's is a pretty good album. Aces is the one for me, but jeans is not, it's not my thing, and Peter's is definitely not my thing. Even though I like R and B, it just it wasn't what I wanted out of my rock stars. You know what I mean? It was just yeah. I mean, if I had not, in my own way, made horrible decisions, I, I could be more judgmental about that. But I mean, a lot of times things seem like they're a really great idea. Like I could see the meeting about it being wonderful, yeah. and everybody leaving like this is the greatest idea ever. Yeah. Phantom of the Park or whatever. This is gonna. This is our, you know, our, our, our hard day's night. This is going to change everything. Right. And you never know until you, you know. It's nostalgically kind of cheesy, but it's, it's kind of cool. So exactly. Um, what, um, what other artists or musicians affected or influenced you as a young player listening to, to music? You know, like, again, on my case, Alex Lifeson, massive, gigantic, huge influence for me. Right. 
Frank Marino, Mahogany Rush, huge Love Frank interest. Frank's just Frank was the shredder of the seventies for me. I think I'm a king me baby. Toasted everybody, but what what guys really influenced you? And and doesn't necessarily even have to be guitarists. It could have been other musicians. Or I mean, early artists. on in the guitar sense, I mean, obviously Randy Rhodes was huge. Uh, Gary Moore was always my guy. Oh, uh, you know, I remember being a little again being fairly young and hearing it was end of the world. End of the world. That solo in the big year that I was like, oh my god, like what is this? Like who is this? Where did this guy come? And uh, so I always fell in love with Gary, Gary Moore's playing, um, you know, but I mean, I, I, literally my, my influences, which kind of explains part of, uh, you know, what I do. It's just, I love great music. So I, mm -hmm. I was never like a metal head. I liked certain metal things, but I mean, I, I was just as happy going, listening to a Neil Sedaka tune. You know, I love Jane's Addiction, love Bjork, love Tom Waits, love Elvis Costello, love Ecstasy. Uh, oh, XTC is amazing. Just one of the great, you know, so, I mean, it, it's to me, I, I can't remember who's, I always say it, but it's like, you know, there's two types of music, you know, good and the other kind. Right. And that's just the way I feel. I mean, it's like, I, if you're, I just, I appreciate badassery in all its forms. Yeah. I mean, and, and I do think, again, I'm going to sound like the old man, get off my long guy here, but, you know, I do think we, you and I, guys our age had the benefit of coming up through possibly the best decade of music. Not to say it's not to say that the stuff that's coming out now is not good. Cause there's a ton of great music that's coming out and maybe that might be part of the problem. There's almost too much music coming out, but that's an, I digress, but I just feel like the seventies was kind of the classic stuff and granted the Beatles. And there was a couple of, you know, Crimson and those kind of guys, you know, Vandergraaf Generator, stuff like that. But I didn't know about that stuff till I was considerably older. And everybody denigrates the 80s, but man, there were some great fucking bands in the 80s. Tears for Fears, aha, there's just so much good symphony. The police, the too. The police, mean. yeah. I mean, so, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I probably sound like the old man get off my lawn guy. But uh, I, I listen to a ton of music, it, new stuff included. So, I mean, I, I don't necessarily feel that same way as you about it. Cause I mean, there's a bunch of new stuff that I listen to that I love. And I think is as good as, as anything ever done. The, I think it's more difficult. The thing that when we were kids, I think things were, it was easier to hit critical mass. Like there, you know, everybody knew who tears for fear, what the fears was. Everybody knew that song at that time. Right. Everybody yeah. knew yeah. Frankie goes to Hollywood. Everybody knew the police, everybody, you know, now there's just a lot more bands. Um, and a lot more music being released. So I don't know that anybody will hit that singular massiveness anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think, and, and that obviously ties in, it, it, you know, when you're growing up and every single girl in school knows a song and every guy knows that song. And, you know, whether it's, you know, you're going even back to Quiet Riot's Mental Health when that broke, it was massive. And oh, huge. everybody had it. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have this kind of cultural touchstone for everybody. And I don't know that you have that anymore. But I don't think you have that anymore with, you know, uh, TV. Like no, I remember going to school and like everybody saw the Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Or, yeah. or, or, or the A-Team. Yeah. Like everybody saw that show. And now it's so fragmented, but I don't think it means that the shows, I think the shows are probably better now, ultimately. Uh, you know, some of the TV shows and some of the creativity uh, is at a higher level than ever, but it's never going to hit that same. But there's just so much. Yeah. I mean, everyone finds their own rabbit hole. And uh, and goes down. Um, how how encouraging or nurturing were your parents for your for your once you started to kind of go down this road? Were they one hundred percent behind you, or how how that worked? I don't think I don't think they're behind me or against me so much. I mean, and I think as any like, look, I think you're a musician. You're young. You see Kiss. You go, I'm going to be a rock star, and everyone around you goes, Sure, you're going to be. A but it's probably no different than I'm going to go be a football player or I'm going to go be a soccer star or I'm going to go be a hockey player. I mean, you know, I, I, it's really hard to look at the people around you, you know, but that's just my buddy. Like, that's not going to, there's, you know, you should really pay more attention in school. Well, so, I guess what I meant though, honestly, Jason was more in specific. Now I'm not talking little kid. I'm talking more your late teenage years where you're approaching the decision-making thing of, do I go to college? Do I go get a factory job? Do I go into That was service? never it for me. I, I was hundred percent bought into music from. Okay. That's I, what I was. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I was never going to go down that road. Okay. For, I mean, it, and it's an insane thing to look back at now, but, but I think that's part of why you can, you know, you can become successful at things in a way because you're just, yeah. That, Blindly that, going. That kind of, for better or for worse, that fearless belief in the fact that this is what I'm going to do. We'll get to how, how old were you when uh, Saigon Kick formulated and, and kind of did their thing and got signed? How old were you at that point? Uh, it's probably 18, 19, 20. Wow. Really? When we formed, yeah. I mean, yeah. And it took about, you know, two years after that. But basically, we were together for about two years and then we got signed. Okay. So you, and you were playing the Miami area or you'd said Tampa. Yeah. Were you from Tampa? Not, well, we had done Tampa? some stuff in Tampa, but we, we played all South Florida. Okay. Florida. South Florida. And did, oh. it, it's, a, it's a typical story of like, you know, playing in front of 10 people, playing in front of 15 people, playing in front of 50 people, a hundred people. And then, you know, towards the end, we were drawing 1500 people two nights in a row. That's crazy, man. I mean, and we didn't, even, we never had a demo tape. We didn't have like a package to send, you know, the labels all came to us. I mean, it was really a backwards way of doing it. Yeah. I heard you mention that Jason Flom was kind of involved. It, 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 how'd that come about? Do you remember? Yeah. I mean, you know, we were, you know, getting all this momentum of playing bigger and bigger and bigger shows. And a, a guy who I reached out to us, who's a manager at the time named Warren Wyatt, uh, right as things were starting to peak in the live sense, uh, said, oh, you know, bringing a bunch of label people down. So Jason Flom came down, uh, Dave Feld came down, and uh, Michael Wagner. They had Michael Wagner, who was yeah. just finished. I think he, just, he had just finished the last Extreme record or whatever. And they came down. They went to the show. And uh, we went across the street after that. And Flom was like, look, let's make this happen. And Michael Wagner was like, I want to do the record. And uh, I only have this window of time because I'm doing the next. I think he was about to start Slave to the Grind, mm -hmm. potentially, or whatever it was. Yeah, so right. he, had, like, he had three weeks. And literally, it was like a Friday night or a Saturday night. And Monday, we were in Los Angeles starting the first record. That's insane. So it was kind of a, yeah, it was a real whirlwind of a. And what and what what did your parents say when you told them that when you went home and said we just got signed and I'm going to L.A. Monday? I think everyone was pretty happy for us at that point. I mean, I think it was. I mean, they we were getting it was building. We, it was building, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, some, something was going on for sure. Yeah. So I mean, and, I think. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Um. So you told me what your first concert was, and and I had first metal concert, first concert, and they, those kind of go hand in hand. Um. Let's jump into your Jason Beeler and Baron Von Bieluski stuff here. Um, when, because I kind of want to work, as I told you behind the scenes, I kind of want to work present day to go back a little bit. Sure. Um, when the, the new album, which I don't have, and I apologize for that, it's called Jason Beeler and the Baron Von Bieluski Orchestra, Songs for the Apocalypse. Um, how did that all come together? Uh, and I know there was some pandemic sort of stuff going on there, pre, you know, 2020, I guess. What what was – can you give me the backstory on that? I mean, I finally decided to officially – I was going to do this record, you know. Uh, uh, so my initial thoughts were let me reach out to, you know, all of my friends in different capacities that I have. And uh, assuming that, you know, I'll reach out to 20 or 25 guys that I respect and think the world of and – I'm sure everyone will be on tour doing this. So I might get three or four guys will say yes. And, you know, it'll be awesome. And that coincided directly with the, you know, the pandemic shutdown of everything. So fortuitously, uh, everyone was home and bored. So yeah. everybody said yes. So it was really that part, part of it was just absolutely wonderful because I got to work with people that I just think the world of, you know, Devin Townsend and, and Butch yeah. Walker and, and Clay Cook and Clint Lowry and David Ellison and, you know, Todd Latore and uh, Andy Blackshirt and, you know, I mean, I, the list goes to Bumblefoot and yeah. Benji from Skindred and all these guys. It was just, it was just an unbelievable process. And I, I don't think it could be duplicated again because it was just, everybody just kicked ass and crushed it. And everything that they sent in was amazing. And it was just one of the most uh, amazing uh, creative processes you could ask for. I mean, just, just, just unbelievable. Just to touch on a couple of songs there, you know, in listening to these tracks the last, I don't know, week or so, 
I kind of, you know, somebody came up to me and didn't know anything about Saigon Kick or Super Transatlantic or, or anything that you've done in the past and said to me, well, what's, what's this? Because the artwork's kind of intriguing. It's pretty cool looking. It's got sort of a, a vibey thing going on, the big top crazy circus sort of vibe. And, and knowing your sense of humor, it makes complete sense, of course. Um, if somebody came up to me and said, what's this dude sound like? Uh, who's this? Why should I check this out? Um, I kind of said, this was my thing that I put up that, you know, actually, I want to I want to segue it into Bear Setters, which is the most recent thing that you dropped on Bandcamp, I believe. Mm -hmm. There's a five track uh, uh, EP out there, and I'm assuming a lot of that material is going to or some of that material might make it onto the new album, right? Yeah, the new the new album is going to have like probably at this point, 16 or 17 songs on it. Holy so that's a, that's so a, a small double album. Clip. It'll be a double album again. Yeah. Wow. And you're doing that on Frontiers or where are you going with that? No, this can be through my own label this time. Oh, okay. uh, they were awesome to me and we did a short term deal and it, and it worked out great. And, mm -hmm. uh, but this one we're going to do ourselves. OK. Um, what I said about it was um, like a lot of your material to my ears, it's like a trip into a sonic equivalent of a bad acid trip. And I've never done acid, mom, I swear. I, I, it's a true story. Uh, into a fun house inhabited by the ghosts of the Beatles, Queen, Oasis, ELO, Meshuggah, and Mr. Bungle. How'd I, how'd I do on that? I mean, I am super flattered. Uh, if, if any of that could even be rem remotely true. Oh, it's can, true. Uh, we can end, we can end it now. And I feel like my day has been, a, you know, my career has been worth it. Do you need my address for the uh, check? Yeah, I'll send that off to you. Okay, cool. Um, but no, there's, there's, you know, the, which that is nothing entirely new for anybody that knows about you in Saigon kick. If they know Saigon kick, that's not a shock. So when I threw this on back in January of last year, I was kind of like, Whoa, Holy shit. That's what he's been up to. This is crazy fucking shit. It's insane in a good way, of course. Right. But um, you know, it's just, it's such a bizarre mix of styles and genres that, this album really defies any categorization categorization. You can't really say it's a metal album because it's not. You can't say it's a pop album because it's definitely not. You can't say it's a prog album because it's really not. It's kind of its own little thing. I guess the best way to put it would be it's an alternative rock album. I, I would think that might be the best way to put it. I mean, I don't really think of it that way, but I mean, right. the thing I'm, I guess the best way I think of it is, is that, you know, we built this kind of sonic playground that all these different people from different walks of life were able to come in and contribute to it and make sense. And the record has this thing. So, like, you wouldn't think of putting Butch Walker and Troy Sanders in the same record. Oh, or Troy's Tom, on this? Yeah. Troy's on it? Oh, shit. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't think of having, like, uh, you know, Todd Latore and Clay Cook from the Zac Brown Band on the same record or Benji from Skindred and Bumble, you know, it's, it's like everyone is other contributor to that record. And it never, to me, never felt like it was forced or, you know, uh, you know it's really hard to try to be diverse. Mm -hmm. But again, going back to my growing up, that's the way music always was to me. So I've always, for better or worse, just gone wherever I wanted to go. And sometimes that's pleased people. And sometimes it's really pissed them off. And, you know, I right. couldn't make a record of 12 heavy songs. It would, you know, right. I respect the shit out of bands that can do that. And like, who's better than ACDC at, at, you know, that, that, that thing they do that better than anybody else in the world can do. Yeah. Um, they've written the I, same I, four, they've written the same four songs over and over for 45 years. And I love it every time. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, 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 I, I just never could function like that. Right. Um, and, uh, but then again, I have a lot of respect for, I think Devin Townsend, the world of him, he does you the just same nailed thing. It. I was just going to say, and I don't mean this, and this is a compliment of the highest order. You, to me, are kind of the American counterpart of Devin Townsend. Because I've been a dev guy from all the way back to Ocean Machine. And some of his stuff doesn't always work for me. There's a few albums I'm like, whoa, man, like, like that's just not going to, that's not going to play much. But there's other ones of his albums, like Ocean Machine, Terria, Accelerated Evil, evolution there there are just canon they're fucking amazing you're in that rarefied air dude well thanks so much i mean and but that's you know I, i'm you know i wouldn't say uh it's kind of neat because when we started talking he had mentioned he was at a saigon kick show when he was a kid really and he, was, and he was really complimentary of it in vancouver i guess we had played a show 
Uh, and we started having this dialogue and, and I started paying more attention to what he does. And uh, yeah, the ability for him, and I respect it, and I understand it, I feel is like, you know, he, he knows he's going into these uncharted territories and he knows he's going to lose people. Right. He doesn't I mean, care. That, he, it's, I wouldn't even say he doesn't care. It's well, he's okay. going to do what he needs to do musically. Right. And, and, you know, you're welcome to it. And, and the thing like with him, I think that's great is like, I think you find some of the people like when, if you revisit his catalog and I find this of any artist that I like, you know, sometimes I'm not ready for where they're going. Right. And sometimes a couple of years later, I listen back and I'm like, oh my God, how did I miss that record? That's like genius, yeah. you know, but yeah. at the time I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's like a super high. I mean, even we mentioned the same breath is fantastic. And I think we, we suffer from the same, you know, musical Tourette syndrome of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, but you know, like you said, it's kind of a, as an artist, you can only go where you want to go and please yourself first and foremost, because if you start doing the other thing, writing to please whoever, your fan base or the record company or or, or to get on America's Most Wanted, or America's Most Wanted, yeah, America <laughs> Idol or something like that, you're you're sacrificing your craft, I think. It's a moving target. I mean, you can't chase that. I mean, I think, you know, I've succeeded and not succeeded based on just following my instincts, you know, and, and, um, and, and listen, I mean, if you look at my playlist, I could probably be put in jail for the, the, the sheer abrupt genre hopping that goes on. Like, I mean, I literally have Meshuggah next to Barry Manilow. Yeah. That, that'll go into Bjork. That'll go into, you know, Porcupine Tree or Stephen Wilson or, De you know, it's like, I just want tunes, Miles Davis into, you know, oh, yeah. it, it's just, I just listen to all that stuff. So. I, that's me, dude. I mean, I'm all over the, the place, but I, I will have to end this interview. If you tell me there's no Gordon Lightfoot on your iPod, or do they even have those things anymore? It's, iPods? It's, what been, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm aware <laughs> of Gordon. It's been, it, I'm aware of Gordon Lightfoot, of course. Um, but I have not added it to the, it's not on the official playlist. Hurting my heart, Jason. I'm so bad. I'm going to change that today. Please get right at least get wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald on there. Come on. Oh, of course, I mean, of course I know that. It's just yeah. Um apology. Kind of summarizes the multitude of tricks in your bag for me. It's crazy melodic with monstrous, crazy multi-stacked harmonies, which is a, a big time sort of hallmark of your your work. Um, and then it's got these crazy fucking solos on it that you're like pfft. And who played that solo on there? Is that the is That's that you? Andy, Andy Black Sugar played uh, a lot of the guitars on the record, solo okay. guitars on the record. Um, so we trade bits and pieces, but I think that's mostly him on that track. And he's brilliant. If people don't know who he is, I've never he, heard him until your album, dude. He's the greatest guitar player, in my opinion, one of the greatest modern guitar players. Who does he play he with? Plays, does he have a band or? He does a lot of solo stuff, which you got to check out. He does. Okay. He plays with KMFDM. Oh yeah, of course. And he plays with. Uh, he's Blondie's guitar player okay uh he played with peter murphy for oh, years fuck. so i mean I'm doing a deep dive on peter murphy next week yeah he's so brilliant in the sense that he's one of the few guitar players that like has one foot in the shred stuff that we grew yep. up mm -hmm. and another foot in the robert fripp brian eno sonic like insanity tapestry and shit. yeah and just weaves them seamlessly so like a lot of those sonic guys can't ever get to the point where they do something like where you're like and a lot of those shred guys never do anything interesting. Exactly, they can't do it. They can't. They can't uh, slow it down. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know not to disrespect any because there's a lot of great musicians, but Andy's about as good as it gets as far as I'm um, concerned. Definitely going to check him out as a result of this. I'd never heard him, so I, now that you say, of course, KMFDM, I know. You know, I mean, I wonder Gunter used to play with that. I wonder if Gunter retired or something like that. Maybe Andy's been with him for the last few years. He just okay. did the whole new record with them. And oh, cool, uh, cool. That's. Gateway band for me into industrial with Frontline and Puppy and all that stuff like that. I love that. So like that shit's in my playlist. And if you look at me, it'd be like, nah, that dude's a metal dude. Nah, I'm far from just a metal dude, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, bring out your dead, crab claw Dan. That there's the juxtaposition of how weird you are. And I say that with all due respect, sir. I take it, I take it as a compliment. You're I mean, just 
the 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 sense of humor is always there. It's always a bit twisted. It's always a bit warped, and it's kind of beautiful. You know, it's just this. I love it, man, because I I see it, the the interviews you've done, the stuff you do on your social media posts. I mean, you you really like to have fun with that kind of stuff, and you have let yourself go. The last time you posted a picture on Instagram, I the dad bod suits you well. It does. I feel really good about it. Um, the last thing uh, on 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 uh songs from the apocalypse were you by any chance contacted by any lawyers from south florida when you use the uh for trademark infringement when you use the very fine people song title i'm just curious no no i I fortunately we live in a world where the general population does not listen deeply into anything on record so the people who got that far were on my side uh, it's true, but now this this viral video is going to be out there, and you know who yeah. might be calling. So thanks, thanks for the help. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anything I can do to that's when insurance. everything was going well. I know. Um, let's see where are we at here. Uh, okay, so your eclectic eclecticism has oh sorry has your eclecticism made it hard for you to be marketed for labels when like when you were signed back in the day to the big labels at all. You know, I was really lucky and we were really lucky back in the day. I remember Jason Flom coming to my house before we did the, you know, the second record. And, you know, we had this wonderful conversation where he looked me in the eye and said, I have no idea what the fuck you're doing. Um, Just go make the record. So, I mean, it it was connecting, but he didn't necessarily, he knew it wasn't the rock and metal of, you know, a few years back. And he didn't necessarily know that it was going to be anything in the future either. Right. Um, But he was creative enough and had enough faith to say, just go do what you do. So we were very fortunate in that sense that we didn't have the label pressure of do this, do that. You know, we had a ballad on the first record that didn't blow up. We, you know, so it wasn't like we changed the formula. I think stylistically the first record is not that different from the second record, um, generally speaking. And uh, we were able to do what we wanted to do. Um, I think once I stopped working in the confines of a band, um, you know, I, I, I just, I wanted to explore more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Um, so I did it hurt us. I think the same things that might've hurt us then have helped make those records have kind of an afterlife Mm -hmm. where I still, to this day, get people going like, Oh, you know, I, I, you know, you had the ballad, so I never paid attention, but a friend of mine played me the water record or played me these songs off the first record or whatever. And I had no idea you know, that that's what you guys were about. Um, so, and it's been really nice, both from a peer standpoint of people like, you know, whatever, Corey Taylor saying nice things or, uh, you know, uh, the, the guys in Five Finger Death Punch or, you know, uh, just hearing nice things about, oh, yeah, those right. records were were cool. I think they're interesting now because they weren't one dimensional. They're absolutely not even close. I mean, we're going to get to the Saigon kicks album, kick albums in a minute here. The three, the first three anyways. Sure. Um, uh, so let me see. I'm just trying to figure out how, okay. So the new albums postcards from the asylum, is that a hard title already? That's the hard title. Any information on like when pre-orders or when that's going to be released? Yeah, I'm, I, uh, we're going to start probably doing pre-orders in January. Okay. Um, because I like to wait until everybody's cash flow is completely depleted by the holidays. <laughs> of yeah. Um uh and then we're looking to try to release it in March. Uh the only thing I mean we'll have obviously the CDs. We're 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 trying to logistically get the vinyl sorted like every oh, other yeah. human being on earth. Yeah, we're it will be a double record again. Wow. Um, so I don't know if I'm breaking new ground as being the first artist to release two double records back to back, but I like to think I am. I hope so. Yeah. Well, the day, yeah, the days of like Miles Davis and stuff like that's pretty rare these days, but that's cool. I got to get, I, that's one I would really like to have on vinyl. So I got to look into that. But, um, and the only place you can get that I'm assuming is on your band camp or no for the first one. Uh, the first one, uh, it's almost completely sold out. Oh, is it? So I'm actually working on finding a few more copies from the warehouse in Italy, strangely enough. Holy and they're going to ship me like they might ship me another it comes in little bits and pieces because everything's kind of gone. So uh, there might be another 20 to 40 pieces coming in the new year at some point. So probably no repress on that, at least not for the for foreseeable future. Anyway. I mean, they may eventually, but I think the problem is it's, it just takes so long. Forcing and it. Yeah. With a label like Frontiers, they have 
so many albums coming out that they can yeah. only reserve so many slots. And it literally, is, it has been taking like, you know, eight months to get vinyl mm -hmm. in yep. a lot of cases. So I'm sure there's other priorities for them than, we, you know, stopping the presses for the day to do 100 or 500 copies of this. Well, how many were pressed initially? Do you know? I, I think they did a couple thousand. Okay. Of the double vinyl. I don't know exactly. Let me ask you this. Since you brought up Frontiers, one of, one of the questions, and maybe you have no idea, or, well, it's relative to you. They tend to do this supergroup thing, or they like to pit, or not pit, but bring two or three or four artists together. And I'm thinking George Lynch and Dino Gilles, Gilles whatever his name is, Jagged yeah. Sacker. Brilliant or, singer. Great dude. Or, yeah, killer singer. Uh, or, or Lynch and Sweet, you know, Michael Sweet, mm -hmm. or you know, Black Swan with Jeff Pilson and, you know, uh, Robin McCullough or something like that. Did, have you ever been approached to do that or? No, I mean, it really came about strangely. Um, their a &R guy for the U.S. was a guy named Nick, and he was super really nice to me and, and kept pressuring me. Like, we want to do this, we want to do this. And I was like, you know, you do know what I do, right? He knew what I did. <laughs> um, and I knew I was going to be the bastard stepchild of their catalog, no disrespect to what they do. Cause they do a brilliant job at oh, yeah. that thing. Yeah. Um, so we did it. We did it. We did a deal. We did the record and I was like, all right, well, you know, we'll, we'll do it together. I mean, I have no issue with doing anything. And we made the record and it was kind of a weird situation because I think their core base of who buys those records from that label, generally speaking, are very much centered around the theme of, I've got a super hot, a super hot chick, a really fast car. We're going to party rock forever theme. Right. Which literally like was the antithesis of anything that base wanted and who picked it up was like Prog Mag UK and right. all these other, you know, which was fantastic for a multitude of reasons um, because it was a whole new base for me because to them, this was a brand new thing. Those people had no idea who, why, what Saigon Kick was. Yeah, right. So it's very rare you get to be rediscovered. I mean, Saigon Kick wasn't so big that it's not like I was a Metallica where oh, right, you right, never right. get to But sure. it, it, it usually follows you to a certain degree. And so this whole new prog base of like this fans of bands like Lepros and Haken and Haken, yeah. all these types of things were supporting the new record. So it was succeeding in an in a, in a, in a avenue or in a venue that they didn't really have any reach into. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, we ultimately decided like, yeah, we're, we're, you know, it was an awesome experience, did great. And we're just going to take it in house for the next, I mean, I already had a label for years, so it wasn't like a huge stretch or something. But I wonder now that you're on their radar, if you might be one of those guys, they call up and say, Hey, you want to do a, a, a super group of George Lynch and Dino and Pilsen, or would you even entertain that? Or would that probably not? Be I love all those guys. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's not a disrespect thing. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm just not the guy who wants to be on 75 records a year. Yeah. Okay. That's you know, just, to me, I think I've got my own little world I've built with my own sure. imaginary friends. And, uh, you know, Do you um, did you tour on this album at all, it, given that it was 21 and the pandemic and stuff? No, or? I really struck yeah. right in the heart of the pandemic. So we, did headline one, uh, I should headline. We, we played one festival in Atlanta that we kind of threw together at the last second. Uh, so it wasn't a full representation of what we were going to do live uh, because a couple of the musicians we were going to use. Of course, got COVID right before we did the festival. Um, so it was kind of thrown together. Uh, Prog Power USA, which is an amazing Prog Power. Project. Killer, killer, yeah. And, and those guys, Glenn and those guys are just amazing. Yep. Um, so they had us do something there last year. But we didn't get the tour behind it. And, and it's kind of a weird thing. The, the records have a, enough of a, there's a depth and a, a width to them that I want to do the right way. Right. Uh, when we do do the show. So it's kind of neat that it's building to the point where we will be able to do our own headline run the way we envision the show being rather than throw and go festival it together. It's not a throw and a go. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah, I don't yeah, really yeah. feel like that does justice to what it is. Yeah. Now that, that leads to another really interesting question. I'll be really interested to see what you say here. The Eddie trunk mantra of live bands play live and don't use tracks. What do you say about that? Cause you do have, these songs are very, there's a lot of depth to them. There's a lot going on. And I'd be like, how are you going to pull that off? I think the world of Eddie Trunk, he's been nothing but supportive to me my entire career. He's a good dude. I don't, I'm not shit. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I'm, yeah. so I just wanted to preface it by that because mm -hmm. in case someone clips a piece of this. <laughs> yeah, right. Blabbermouth. Uh, my opinion is 
Uh, I understand people saying like, okay, your center lead vocal is not on, not live. You know, your, your drums are not live. You know, your, your bass player who's standing there is not live. Right. It's on track. I mean, that stuff's kind of weak. I know Devin does the same thing. I, I know a lot of the prog bands do. I can't bring a 48 piece orchestra out on the road with me exactly uh, in every capacity. So um, everything that we do live will be live. Uh, every musician that I can employ to do the parts correctly live within our grasp of being able to do it will be live. That's my preference. I would love to do it in a way ultimately that employed all live musicians. Uh, if that comes to a point where we can't do that that way, I have no issue with using certain backing tracks to get certain sounds a certain way right. or uh, to, to do that live. And I, I don't really begrudge anybody who does that. I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I have enough problems figuring myself out, let alone figuring out what any <laughs> right like, to make judgment on some band that's got a huge fan base. That's, you know, that is playing everything off the lot. It's like, I, if, you know what? If people are showing up buying tickets and jumping around, having a good time, it's serving a purpose. Do you have kids? I do. Too. And do you mind if I ask how old they are? Uh, they're 26 and 22. Yeah, so you have kids my age. I have a 25-year-old and a 27-year-old, and my oldest is an IT tech guy, right? So whenever I can't figure out anything on my laptop, which is most of the time, quite frankly, or even my cell phone, it's like, uh, hey, dude, what the what the fuck do I do with this? Because I can't figure this out. You know, it's right, like right. it's kind of sad in a way, but it is what it is. You know, that's I got the olds, so to speak. You can only keep up with what you can keep up with. Yeah. Um, real quickly here, um, you did a couple of covers too on, on uh, I think it was on the uh, Birds of Prey EP. You did Wonderwall oh, and yeah. Don't Bring Me Down. And mm -hmm. these are super cool covers because they're, you know, to take a song like Wonderwall, which has been overplayed to death. Great, beautiful, amazing song. Don't get me wrong. But it's one of those ones where, like, when you walk into a coffee shop, somebody's playing, you're like, oh, man, I'm, let's go somewhere else. You know? That's why I did it, because I knew it was such taboo, and it's been it's, done a billion and a half times. I but was it's like, this is, very this is different, though. It's very downbeat, jazzy almost. It's very cool and smoky feeling. You know what I mean? Cool. Yeah, yeah. and same thing with the, uh, Don't Bring Me Down, which is a classic ELO song. You do something really, really cool with it. Um Thanks, man. So I would suggest anybody that's checking out, Jason, check those songs out because they're super cool. Um, let's get into Saigon Kick. Can we do that? Sure. Okay. And we're at about an hour. Can we go about another 25 minutes or so? Sure, let's go. All right, cool. Um, so statement here, but a question at the end is, you know, there are a lot of cool bands that defied categoriz categorization. I can't speak today for some reason. Categorization in the early 90s, like Jane's Addiction, Faith No More, Warrior Soul. I don't know if you know those guys. Yeah. Killer band. Those first three albums are amazing. And Saigon Kick, which was your baby, along with your other three bandmates. Um, what is your take on what was going on at that time in the music industry? Because basically we had the hair metal was kind of dying towards the end of the 80s. And, you know, you could look at uh, Jane's as one of the very, I guess, trendsetters of the alternative metal sort of thing and i mean that those first well the you know obviously nothing shocking is just a fucking monster of an album um what yeah what was happening there that and i know that had to have affected your writing and what you guys were doing what what's your take on that well i was really into as, as silly as it sounds I mean, we would go to these alternative clubs that were playing things like the cure and you know but not play any heavy metal whatsoever it was like you know mm -hmm. not welcome you know, mm -hmm. um, so I would hang out there and kind of see what was going on there. And I remember specifically being in those clubs, which were as anti-metal kind of establishments as you could have. And all of a sudden, I started to hear Soundgarden. And then I heard Jane's Addiction. And I heard, I think, some of even The Cult, which right. was kind of this heavier alternative music. And for me, um, even though I'm undeniably gorgeous and rich you are. and handsome, absolutely, uh, I I never felt like there was this. I was never going to be on stage like with my shirt off, like wiggling appropriately uh, to garner success off of that. Right. And I never was one 
who could really write songs about this chick is so fine and you know let's party 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 and you know it just wasn't that wasn't in my lexicon um I, not that those songs are bad those are great songs and awesome topics just for me right so uh jane's addiction was the band that i saw that and soundgarden to a large extent too were these bands that were doing heavy music that meant something it was going somewhere else it wasn't silly topically it was dark and mysterious and you know voodoo-esque and um tribal and 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 visceral and all these things that you know that really changed so that changed my whole world at that point and i think that's where i was like you know if i can do this and at the same point bring in all my influences melodically from things like the beatles and elo and you know going down you know to kind of queen you know juggle these worlds that make sense to me that mean everything to me because they both equally mean a sure. lot to me sure um so that's kind of where the, the 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 you know the my mindset was is you know i wanted to make heavy music um interesting music uh sonic music that that all at the same time just wasn't like you know you know man that chick looks great in those jeans that's cool Pretty stuff easy. too. That's cool stuff too. But. It is. It's wonderfully important. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying it isn't. Just for me, I wanted what, to do that. Do you remember? Do you recall like the first Jane's or Soundgarden songs you might have heard? I saw Jane's Addiction live, opening for Iggy Pop. Oh wow! Uh, before Nothing Shocking came out, um, right before it came out uh, in Miami, okay. and uh, I I just went because everyone was like, "Oh, Iggy Pop's a legend," and I, I was blissfully ignorant of. I just knew yeah. the name. I didn't really know anything about Iggy Pop, which is bad on me. Yeah, so really. I went to see them. It's the typical story. There was like 30 or 40 people. They came out. And I mean, I was just like, oh, my God. So my first experience with them was live. Wow. Um, and I was just floored. I mean, I was yeah. in, in every single thing they did. I mean, I, I still think to this day that, you know, I've never seen a band that. I mean, again, it was it was. Was it them or was it them reaching me at the perfect time for it to have that impact? You know, I yeah. needed that yeah. and they had it. And that, uh, that confluence of events. It's just, and it was just life changing it, to the point where I went home that night, grabbed every friend I had and they were playing like an hour and a half north. And they played in Miami. Then they were playing in like Fort Lauderdale the next night. And oh, I was shit. like, we're all going. We're going. If I, you got to see this. You'll never That's believe weird. what's happening. And, and we all went and saw that. And, um, yeah, so that I mean, I, I, I attribute so much to that band being, and I, I think it's like people always give Nirvana or Alice and oh, that's where grunge started. And to me, it started, you know, those Soundgarden records were years before that stuff came. They out. were Soundgarden was the first band signed from that that scene, and I love Alice. I'm, I mean, Alice are my yeah, they're a great band. I don't mean fucking, and they they have a lot. They. I call them the Saigon kick of Seattle because there was a lot, you guys have a lot in common, the, the dual part harmonies. And, uh, you know, I don't, I think they sang in fourths, I believe from they're, each they're, other. They're, they're, they're a brilliant band. And, uh, you know, I think the problem we had is we just, didn't, we didn't, we weren't smart enough, nor were we part of a scene. So Seattle had a scene where you yeah. can see all the bands doing something similar. LA had a scene mm -hmm. where yep. all the bands generally speak. We were in Miami. So we had yeah. like Miami Sound Machine, yeah. us, Nuclear Valdez, Tom yeah. Petty. I remember them. And Molly Hatchet. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like, uh, there, nothing made sense. There wasn't. Leonard no Skinner. Well, no, it was Skinner Gainesville, I guess, right? Uh, Jacksonville, right? Or ja I thought they were Gain Gainesville. Maybe they were Gainesville. Gainesville. But I mean, oh, yeah. so, so like there was there was a lot of great music. But you had no all. scene. You had no, no scene, scene to attach yourself. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we weren't as aware or, or, or able to execute like, you know, Alice in Chains was a glam band saw what was happening with the scene and modified everything yep. to be that way. Pantera, yep. yeah. same thing, was like yep. it was real 80s kind of yep. spandexy, let's kick it up, but saw what was happening. But I think they saw what was happening because they were part of a scene. And yeah. so we were just like, well, why can't we do a ballad? Because we dig ballads and why can't we? So we became this rarefied air of being hated by all the hair metal bands and then being hated by all the grunge bands because we had a ballad. Like we were just in between everything. But I think... Extreme was that way. I think King's X was that way. I think, you know, Warrior Soul, maybe to a certain extent, got caught in that kind of gap. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that that's, you know, worst things can happen. 
I mean, James is probably and Soundgarden. Obviously, they were in that scene, and James was L.A. Right? They were L.A. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they were completely outside the L.A. box of bands. I mean, they were so far out there; it wasn't even compare. I, I mean, they were playing, from my understanding, of they were playing like these art installations, yeah. weird underground punk. It was right. it was not the strip. They no. weren't playing the whiskey and no. the, you know all those you know yeah I, stuff like that. I definitely remember, like, I think the first song I heard was a mountain song. I, I know there's the Jane, I, I think it's the Jane's EP, I think it is. Is that a full album? Triple X was their first. Triple X. Is that a full yeah. album or an EP? Um, my memory's not serving me well here. I think it's I, an EP. I, I had it. I know, I loved it. Yeah, I have it too. Um, but I remember hearing the mountain song, and I'm like, whoa, what the hell is that? And then I get nothing shocking, and we're going to come back to that in a minute because I want to ask you specifically about a specific track. You might sure. know what I'm going to reference there. Um and they were just so cool. And, you know, although I'm a guy, then, you know, uh, you and I are both guys of the late 80s and the or the 80s and the 90s. I never really dug a lot of the bands from Seattle, with the exception of Soundgarden and Alice. Those were the two bands. And there are some other ones. You know, I like Mother Love Bones first album. And I, you know, I, I dug uh, my sister's machine. I don't know if you remember them yep. and, and Tad a little bit, some of that stuff. And there's of course the Melvins, but and the Melvins were completely on another Island, but Soundgarden, man. I mean, dude, I saw them open for Voivod of all things with get this faith. No more was the opening band with Patton on his first tour with them. Well, we opened had, up for faith. We opened up for faith no more on Patton's first tour with them in Miami. So I got okay. kicked in. And was this played- after Epic broke, though? No, right before. Really? It was his first time. He had just joined the band. What month so, was this? Do you remember? I can't remember exactly, but it was like, I I, I only knew them from We Care A Lot. Yeah, that's was obviously not Mike Patton. Um, so, but uh, so we, we had done a show with him then, and then we had played with Soundgarden in Tampa. Oh, uh, did you really? At uh, li- uh, Livestock was the show that we did with them. And I remember that because, uh, you know, Kim had to borrow my distortion pedal because he broke his distortion pedal. Get the hell out of here. That's fucking cool. So what do you remember what album that was for for Soundgarden? Would that have been Loud Love? It would have been 91, 92. So probably Loud Love maybe or? I think it might have been after that, right? Well, out, what was after that? Loud Love was 88, I think. No, Loud, no, loud Love was 90. Was it? 89. It was the tail end of I, I don't remember the dates exactly, but whatever yeah. it was, it was 91, 92. It was okay. There. And um, yeah, they were awesome. Yeah, I got to actually go backstage. Nobody was, you know, nobody knew these bands. You know, Voivod was the main reason I went there for Nothing Face. I had heard of Soundgarden, hadn't even heard of Faith No More. And I, I just walked backstage and started talking to Kim. And let's just say we both were probably not in a sober state at that point in time, I'm guessing. Happens. And, uh, and I actually got to meet Chris backstage, too. Very cool guys. Um, but the club that they played here in Lancaster, a place called kind of the infamous place that unfortunately went down with COVID called the Chameleon Club. I played there um, myself. Have you been there? Back in the day, yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Are you serious, dude? Yep. Why did I miss you? Where? How did I miss you? I, I come in under the radar and do really weird shows. But dude, oh wait, did you, was this with Saigon or with yourself? Yeah, Saigon. We played the Chameleon Club. Do you remember with who? I don't even remember where it was last week, let alone 20 years ago. <laughs> All right. I have a weird memory. I do. I don't remember, like you said, I don't remember what I ate yesterday or what, you know, any of that kind of stuff. But I remember these little historical musical things, you know, failed musicians. So I remember that kind of shit. But um, all right. So uh, talk about, can you talk a little bit about how you guys formed and got signed to Third Stone and got major distribution with Atlantic? And then I wanted to ask you about this weird posting on Wikipedia. And I, You've probably seen it, I'm sure, but there's this weird posting about this Paul Auger guy being the musical director and and Alex Michaels being a guitar work collaborator. Does that ring any kind of bell to you? No. Don't know who either of those guys are. So it's garbage. Are you trying to tell me things that are posted on the internet are not fact? Are you are you seriously gonna are you seriously gonna break my bubble? So it's uh, bullshit then. That's bullshit. Total. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm like, what the fuck? Why does Jason need some dude to help him write songs? I don't get that at all. 
So there was no Paul Auger guy involved in the in the beginning. Don't, of the band. You never heard the name before you, uh, you mentioned it. I don't do the wiki thing, but you now know about it, sir, and you can address it with your. No, uh, I, I, your I like it to be wrong. It makes me happier. Well, tell me about how the band formed quickly and sure. the contract, and, and and I guess was Third Stone because you mentioned Flom. Was that an imprint of Atlantic? I'm guessing or. Trying to do it really briefly, we were basically the only four guys that couldn't get in other bands because the hair metal band scene was raging and we weren't able to get in those bands that were going to break. And there was a series of bands that looked like they were right on the cusp of being huge. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Tough Luck was this band that was, you know, we loved. Um, and there's a couple of other, and they weren't really so much a glam band, but, but that scene that everybody had was kind of in South Florida and we couldn't get in those bands. We we're the, you know, the four less musicians that, so it was kind of like, we looked around and we're like, well, it's either you idiots or, <laughs> or I'm going to sit home. So I might as well at least try. Give it a um, go. Right. And, and give it, and, and when I say you idiots, I mean, I mean, all of us were looking at each other like, we yes, were idiots. of course, of course. Uh, and uh, so we put the band together, long story short, we got bigger and bigger and bigger and act, you know, it all kind of worked. We got signed by Flom, like we discussed earlier. At that same time, Michael Douglas uh, was doing an imprint deal with Atlantic Records. Uh, so he was starting his version of that label. We so, talking the actor? The actor, yeah. No shit. Third, Third Stone was Michael Douglas's company. I didn't know that. Okay, that's very interesting. It was really cool. And then, um, so Flom and Michael and everybody and Doug Morris at the time, who was a big one oh, no, Atlantic, kind of did a no, joint venture with us. And the other artist was Nona Gay, uh, no, or, you know, Marvin Gaye's daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so we were the two, you know, th you know, third stone artist. And that's how that kind of all came about. And so any sort of stories about, you know, that first, that while well, you already said one, you flew out on a Monday and you had what, 13 days to record the album. Yeah. We did that record really, really fast with the amazing Michael Wagner, who's, we don't but, have enough time to talk about how brilliant exactly. It is. But you already had all that material ready, right? You weren't you didn't write any of that stuff. In yeah, the I mean, Michael was pretty pretty really interesting. I mean, he taught me a lot uh, just by watching him. Uh, but you know, his theory on that was like, you guys already are doing what you do, and the idea here is not to take it all apart and build it back again in some kind of weird mm -hmm. way. Like, just do your live show. Let's have some amazing dinners. Let's have a great time. So, like, literally, I don't remember making the record as much as I remember all the different restaurants he would take us to. <laughs> we probably spent more because we didn't realize we were paying for it either. Oh, uh, right. We, we probably spent more on dinners than we did making the record. No shit. Uh, and it was this amazing, magical time. But that was his thing. He's like, these guys don't know what they're doing. If we go into this clinical environment and start making a record and it's red light and this and get that take, it's, it's going to be bad. Let, let, let's go in and have a kind of great time and accidentally make a record while we're doing it. And which that was part of the studio. Genius. Where'd you record it? At? Scream studios, which okay. is the same place extreme did more than words and okay. porn graffiti and all that stuff. Wow. So and that yeah. you do that. And then what kind of touring did you do to support that album then? Well, we played with Ozzy in Japan. We opened up for him at the Budokan, which was unbelievable. A career highlight. Cause that was my first show. Yeah. So, to go from seeing Randy Rhodes as a kid and being in you know the front, just being blown away, to getting an opportunity to open for Ozzy two nights at the Budokan, which is the legendary Budokan of cheap, you know, so mm -hmm. cheap records cheap. in my head, yeah. yep. and uh, and then becoming friends with Zach. So Zach had me like on stage behind his amp, and I'm like, you know, so I can actually see the point of view where I was watching. Wow, it was such a Lion King moment. Like I, other than Zach holding me up nude, you know, over his head, like. While they played that song, which is a time a story for another time. Yeah, that's a blabbermouth headline right there. But go ahead. But I mean, uh, it was just such a Lion King moment of like you know coming full circle and that's and, uh, and 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 doing that. So it, it, that was a huge moment. But then we toured with Extreme in Europe a lot before More Than Words broke. Mm -hmm. And then we did all you know all over the U.S. clubs and all the usual stuff. So is this um, Mike Inez playing bass? Yeah. Okay. Was, and. Uh, Randy Castillo, right? Randy Castillo, okay, who's passed, right? And then um, we toured in the U.S. We did some shows with Rat. We did some shows with. Uh, we opened for the Ramones for like four or five shows, which is amazing. That I've heard you say that, and that's bizarre to me because I was lucky enough. I'm old enough 
to have seen the Ramones, the real Ramones with Joey and yeah, that's Lee who we played and Johnny. And I'm telling you, dude, I've never seen this. Is probably Pet Cemetery year era, we would brain have been drain, maybe brain drain, I think. And I never saw so many people being carried out of a show fucked up before in my life. I we played with them, and we did not play like off the beaten path venues where it would not be. You know, we played Hammerjacks in Baltimore. With mm. Them. Mm. We played uh, in Connecticut with them. We, and we played in Philadelphia somewhere else. Uh, but um, I was convinced before doing the shows that we were going to be murdered. Yeah. Because, right. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I just thought for sure, like, it, this was a great run, but we're going to be killed. Like, it, the, 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 the last thing this crowd wants is anything we are serving. Yeah. Um, and uh, somehow we made it through and they were, I mean, I can't say we hung out and did a ton of stuff, but there was times where we would talk, to, you know, get a chance to talk to Joey or whatever. He would ask mm -hmm. a question about a mic stand or whatever. And it was just such an amazing, like looking back now, just to be, you know, the smallest of footnotes of what they were a part. It's just amazing. Yeah. you. Uh, that's crazy. I mean, that's so cool. I feel very blessed to have been there in that era to have caught them kind of at the tail end before Joey died. Um, so you, you do, and, and you had a mild, Rather, I guess you call it a mild hit off that album with what you say, right? I don't know. Was it? I mean, it did well, but definitely not like didn't change the world, right? Know. Do you have any idea how many of those, how many albums you sold ultimately? I think with on that, that first record, we did we sold maybe like 100, 150,000 records, which by today's standard is like triple platinum. It's massive, yeah. But, but back then, then, that's kind of back, back not then, a it's lot. like, mm, you know, this isn't working. So, what they want to do, put you right back in the studio then, or? Um, for album yeah, two. we made a couple of really, well, I don't know if we made bad decisions, but we got offered to do a Bon Jovi tour in Canada, which we turned down, Ooh. um, because I was kind of thinking like, this record's not connecting mm -hmm. and our manager's like, we go away and do another two or three months and the label starts taking stock of what's working and not working. We could be on the cutting block here. Right. So okay. let's get in while we can and seize the day before they start paying too much attention to the fact that you have not sold 10 million records. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, you know, I was writing the whole time and had a bunch of demos and we, and then because of when we were, because we had just really decided, okay, we're going to go make a record. There wasn't enough time to, in the schedule, Wagner was booked for five years and they, all these different things. And uh, all the cool grunge producers we're going to have nothing to do with us. Right. So we went to Sweden, to Stockholm, uh, and, and, and recorded the lizard in Stockholm. And I got the opportunity to produce it. Flom was like, I don't know. Like I said, he said, I don't know what you're doing or not doing, but just go do it. I was like, uh, okay. You know, now you were still on, were, but you were still on third stone with that album, right? You never really got, I thought for some weird reason, I don't know if this is a fever dream or what, but for some reason I thought you'd actually bounced up and been signed to Atlantic proper, but that's not the case. No, both those records were third stone Atlantic. We were on Atlantic records. I mean, it wasn't one of those weird things like, like, like third stone kind of had an input. So they had some people that worked there that were great people. Dick Rudolph. Right. Dick Rudolph is actually Meyer Rudolph's father. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so he was kind of their A&R guy there. And, but we were definitely part of the Atlantic. I mean, in New York, we were always at the Atlantic offices and it wasn't right, like right. Kind of a far removed. It was more of a joint venture kind of situation. But you um, didn't have, I guess my point was you, you were still an imprint. So you had the label behind you, but you didn't have like the massive machinations of the label as far as the money. We had the okay. same money. It was a major deal. Oh, I mean, was it? Okay. We were really fortunate in that sense. Uh, and then, yeah, so we went and, and we made the Lizard record um, kind of in isolation because we weren't in LA or we weren't in New York. We were off by ourselves in Stockholm and we finished it and, uh, for, you know, we didn't really, we went to, uh, actually, we went to Mexico to film a video for Hostile Youth mm -hmm. um, with the guy who directed Jane's Addiction's Gift uh, documentary. And while we were in Mexico, uh, we got a call from either Flom or Doug Morris or whatever, who said this radio station in Florida has started playing the ballad. And it's exploding. Like, it's unbelievable what's happening. You're selling, like, you know, whatever it was, like tens of thousands of records in Miami a week. Like it's like going berserk. Yeah. Uh, and he goes, you guys have a hit. So we're going to switch gears and we're going to go after that. And 
it was, you know, it was a double edged sword. We were well aware of the fact that maybe having a ballot at this point is not the best ground to be standing on because everything had already started to change. Right. But it is what it is. And the song connected with everybody and became a, you know, a, a big hit. And, and uh, the rest is kind of a history. So, you know, with the lizard, the one thing, I mean, this, this out, the first album is fairly schizophrenic, but this album I think is even slightly more schizophrenic and it actually gets a little more schizophrenic than that on water. And by schizophrenic, what I mean is it's such a mix of styles. You got the brutally heavy songs like Hot, Hostile Youth, Body Bags, The Lizards, Peppermint Tribe. And then you got the alt rock, wistful alt rock sort of tracks or like, you know, All I Want or Feel the Same Way. And then you get the more brooding tracks like God of 42nd Street and World Goes Around. And then this ballad, this, this ballad that is, I want you to take this the right way. It's a cheesy ballad, but it's a beautiful cheesy ballad. And I love it. But here's the thing. I'm thinking after that happens, like how many, you know, how many housewives went out and bought that album and how many therapy sessions they had to go through to get over what they heard on that album after they thought they were getting that song. You know what I mean? One of the great pride marks of my life is that we horrified soccer moms all across the nation. Boom. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it, well, but, but as you can see by what I do today and what I did then, I mean, it, that's what I do. Like, you know, I am, and I don't say it to make a joke, like, I love Barry Manilow. I know. I mean, I love ballads. I love songs that are sappy. I, and that's great. I also think Meshuggah is amazing. Like, right. I want to do what I want to do. So right. I don't want to try to pretend like I'm this cool, angry guy that only does metal, nor do I want to do nothing but ballads or jazz. or I just want to go where I want to go, selfishly. Um and it's and looking back, I mean, it, it's insane to think that a crowd in a modern day age with marketing and everything's got to be focused and everything's about like the slogan and people don't pay attention enough. So you got to hit them with the right color and the right two or three word phrase in 30 seconds or they're not paying attention. I can see why it's insane to to, to just say, well, yeah, I'm going to use a horn section, then a gospel choir. Then we're going to do a, like a 1920s tune. Then we're going to do a punk tune. Then, you know, but. I never thought that way. Um, and for better or worse, that's where I wound up even still to this day. I mean, that's how I see music. That's how I hear things. That's what I want to do. That's what I love doing. That's all real for me. Um, yeah, right. Are you telling me, though, nobody <laughs> at Atlantic or Third Stone or whoever, whatever, the PR group, or nobody saw that Love is on the Way was going to explode? It really was happening all at once. I don't know if they were... Like, I think they were just the first record didn't do enough where I think we were on Doug Morris's like, right. The Radar. four records that are going to explode for Atlantic this year are right. Right. We weren't on that list. I mean, I don't think we, we were kind of on this, like, what a strange band. Yes. Right. You know I, mean? I don't know that we want to get rid of them, but I don't know that we want to keep them. Let's just let that fester over here for a while by itself and see what happens. So it was kind of Jason Flum's vanity project sort of thing. Maybe he was always super. I mean, people have these horrifying stories of how the label cut your hair, wear these pants. What are you doing? This do this type of photo shoot. You know, we were really blessed by a group of people who are like, we don't know what the fuck you're doing. So just do it. Just uh, keep doing it until we tell you to stop. Wow, you know? that's that's crazy. I mean, and, and again, I mean, I, I do think you know in 1992 i don't know you're i don't know how old i am there probably because i'm a year or two older than you so 27 28 somewhere in that range i gotta believe that you you personally sir were probably responsible for some sort of fertility boom in 1992 did you ever look into the statistics on that well you know the entire ipa beer drinking hipster movement is my children oh it is yeah <laughs> See, I didn't know that, but now it, it kind of all makes a lot together, of sense. You'll say yes. Yeah. Um, you should be getting some kind of residuals from every parent. I don't want to get into my financials, but I'm not wanting for much. <laughs> so I guess we talked about oh, I have this is the one where I wanted to hit you with this. So um did perhaps do you know Dave Navarro and Perry at all or no. I wish okay. I did though. Have they ever, okay, so they've never contacted you and said, uh, hey, dude, that song Cruelty? Kind of, I mean, kind of sounds a little bit of them roles. It might, one <laughs> can make a case 
that there is a heavy, that the great thing about my creativity is I am generally speaking so bad at ripping people off that it never sounds like what I'm trying to do. Right, right. Well, that one, I that one, that is one might be one that, that one might be slightly close. Hmm. But you know what? I just heard the other day that freaked me out. And go back and listen to this. Okay. Because I was I was I was listening to the uh, the new Bono Surrender. Uh, I haven't heard he it yet. Out, he put out this new autobiography, which is fantastic. Oh, oh okay, okay. And but it's got all musical bits in it. Okay. So he started talking about where the streets have no name, uh, legendary U two song, obviously. Of course. And the version of it that he's playing is I don't know whether it's from a demo or it's just, you know. It is totally heroes by David Bowie. Oh, I well, yeah. Now that you say it, I hear it. Yes, but like, I didn't I, realize that at all. Like I was like, oh my god, that's like, like verbatim the chord. Like it felt like the chord progression, the melodic structure of it. Um, oh, you hear it right there, just the the rhythm of it. Dun, 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 dun. And then and then the chordal. Yeah, the minute you said that, I'm like, dude, that's it, make. But it never dawned on me. So no. No, I like well, it only good. dawned on me last night as I'm listening to Cruelty because, or wait a minute, yeah, no, that was this morning. I was listening to Water, and I hadn't listened to Water in a lot of years because you know how it is, man. You move in these oh, waves man. of listening, and I'm like, dude, I fucking totally forgot how killer this album is. Might even be my favorite of the three albums. Um, oh, thanks, man. But the minute I'm hearing Cruelty, I'm or Cruelty's on. Um, is on uh, the lizard, and yeah. and I'm but I'm like listening. I listen to both of those this morning just to kind of reacquaint myself to the songs, and I'm like, all right, that one I definitely I definitely hear that a little bit. What, what, little... Yeah, I mean, uh, the difference is you two ripped off heroes, and we ripped off an intro. That's um, true, you did, and it is an intro. It is so. I should have ripped off Stairway to Heaven or something. Would have been maybe the more appropriate, or maybe uh, the Macarena. Hallow be thy name or something like that, right? <laughs> um, okay, so Water, the third album. And then when we, when we get through with that, got a couple quick questions on that. I got two general questions, and then we'll hit the albums and get you out of here, okay? Sure. Um, so the third album comes out September 93. You've got a new bassist in Chris McLernan. He mm -hmm. replaces Tom. Well, did Chris did the whole Lizard tour with us. So oh, Tom he did? Was out, yeah, he was in the band from the very beginning of that whole cycle. Okay, was... Tom just left to do other things or was there an issue or was it just moving on? Um, we, hmm, how does one politically correctly, not meant for each other's worlds. Gotcha. Gotcha. That works for me. Um, so can you talk about, let's see. Um, yeah. Oh, so the really big news though is quite frankly, Matt leaves uh -huh. and, yeah, did you know that? By the way, I, I I was not aware until you just brought it up. But that's okay. kind of well, mark. it was thirty. It was twenty nine years ago. I just thought I'll let fill you in on that. Um, I'm slow on the uptake. Clearly, sir. Clearly, uh, but yeah. So Matt leaves. You take over as lead vocalist. You were always co vocalist, anyways. And in some instances, your voice is even more prevalent than his in the mix at times. What happened there? Again, we're going to go with the same. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to avoid you know, saying anything negative about anybody. He's a super talented singer and a huge part of Saigon Kick's first two records. Um, I wanted to keep exploring and doing more and more and more different things. I'm sure one could make a case that, you know, I was very driven about this and he didn't want to do that. And, you know, the musical difference stuff came to a head. We were in, again, we went to Stockholm to start that record. So we were not, again, For which one, the, Water? For water. for water too we went okay. back to the same studio okay so we weren't in like la or new york where people would really be going like what the hell is you know you just had a number one hit on mtv what are you thinking mm -hmm. we were like by ourselves and he decided he wanted to leave so he left and uh so we just started telling ourselves well you know this is going to be exactly like when peter gabriel left genesis <laughs> yeah right you know what could possibly go wrong uh yeah um uh, it didn't turn out exactly like that strangely enough uh but we just we were blissfully ignorant to any you know i wouldn't say negative we, you know it's always a bummer when things don't work out the way you want them to but we just went ahead and made a record and right. uh in many ways it was a super creative you know process because i wasn't reading in magazines you know it's over this right this, you know and we were just by ourselves in stockholm so we would go eat and drink and make a record 
Well, yeah, you're talking the 90s. You're not talking 2000s where maybe that might garner a small headline on Blabbermouth or something like that, you know, or, or social media or whatever, you know. The genius yeah. of our manager was that because the Swedish currency was depressed at the time, when we started the record. Cheap there. Um, yeah. So he had Atlantic wire all the funds to Sweden because we were getting like two for one dollar to crown, you know, uh, Krona, right. uh, whatever the rate was. So they wired the entire budget to us in Sweden and then Singer quits. But we already had all the cash for the record, so they couldn't even stop it. Oh, they couldn't even pull it back, right? They couldn't even say, like, we're not paying for this anymore. Right, right. So so we just made the record. It was was kind of wonderful. Uh, It's a killer album. It might even be, quite frankly, more – I think it's more diverse than The Lizard, which is very diverse, as as we kind of – as I laid out before. You know, again, you've got the monster heavy tracks like One Step Closer, Torture in My Heart. But then you got a lot of experimental stuff like Water, Sergeant Steve, The Way – and then the obligatory kind of, I guess you call it a ballad, on and on, which, oh, man, I fucking love that song. Oh, um, and then Fields of Rape, which, as difficult as the title might be, it's a gorgeous song. Any specific memories about writing, producing, and touring for this one? Well, you just gave me some, but did you do any touring on this? A lot of touring or so not? Basically, the record came out, did okay. Um, you know, it, it wound up selling like 100, 150,000 copies in the U.S. Um, so it wasn't... A barn burner by any, mm-hmm. by any situation. Uh, we did a little bit of touring and then realized like this isn't going to probably work in terms of the fan base, which I totally get. Mm-hmm. And then we got a call randomly from somebody at Atlantic going, "You guys are the the Led Zeppelin of Indonesia." What? And I'm like, "What? What does that even mean?" <laughs> um, so I had to even look up where Indonesia was at that point, <laughs> and sure enough. The ballad from that record and and on and on were massive hits. So we went out of nowhere at, at basically being on you know death's door. You know, uh, we went to Indonesia to do these dates. They wanted to bring us over for like these four. So we we're playing like packed arenas and had like yeah. military escorts. Off. It was like Beatlemania. It, could, it was the strangest. It was like Sex Farm went to number one in Japan. <laughs> kind of Spinal Tap. Yeah, Boom. yeah, bizarre. Um, so we went over there and, and wound up going there like two or three times. And uh, the people were wonderful. The cities, we toured these, you know, obviously went to Jakarta, Bali, mm-hmm. uh, two other cities, uh, Surabaya and Bandung, I believe is the other one. And, and was just playing these massive arenas and, you know, packed people with knowing all the songs. And, and your headlining? Kind of weird- your headlining? Your headlining. headlining. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so it was like this weird second surreal life uh, for the record there. Right, and it went on. The, the 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 water record went on to becoming the second biggest Saigon Kick record uh, overall, behind um, the lizard. Behind the lizard, yeah. yeah. So that was Did, kind, of, kind of cool. Were you on Death's doorstep when you say that? You mean you were about ready to be dropped? Was that your indication? Or? I don't think the label was really thrilled, yeah. and I don't think we were thrilled. And uh, you know, I think just going to move on and do different things. I mean, we were kind of in that mindset of like, when you toured, were you a three piece or did you add another? Uh, we had another player. guitar player named uh, Pete Dombrowski. Super okay. talented guitar player. Um, again, man, I don't understand how I missed it because I was pretty tuned in to you guys and the scene. I just never heard of you opening for anyone. And well, you said you came to Philly, so clearly I missed that. That that's a bummer. That's I that sucks because I would love to have seen you guys. Um, uh, we came to Philly with King's X once. Why? Well, I'm glad you said that because we're going to segue to that. Okay. I don't know if you saw, but I just did an interview with Doug uh, Monday. I wouldn't think that you would, but I did a, a lengthy interview with Doug that was killer and just a wonderful, wonderful, amazing dude. I'm a huge fan. And I saw something digging around on, you know, articles and here it comes. research on you, which I feel I did a pretty adequate job here. Um, I came across an article. It's a print article, clearly, from back around the time. And it says, um, let's see, where does it say? S- yeah, sometime after the, was that for the first album or was that for the Water album? First record, I believe. Yeah, for, that's what I thought because that's what it indicated. It says you guys were opening for them and apparently you were thrown off the tour, the opening slot, because you you went to choke the manager, the tour manager of King's X. Yes, all true. <laughs> it's um, true. Doug was super supportive 
and had we'd seen him in like certain magazine articles wearing a shirt and it's like really cool because we thought that band was amazing yeah uh, and they are amazing they are amazing yeah um so we we got asked to do the tour with them and i was like this is great you know what i mean I started opening up for them and they're the first couple of shows like the sound check was like pushed all the way to like doors because they were doing these long extensive sound checks with their tour manager so like you know the doors would open then we get to throw our stuff up and start to said i was like eh, this is kind of not cool and then the you third a, fourth, do you have any roadies when you're doing this or is it you guys doing the load ins and load outs well we were trying to help because we only had so many minutes like it was like we were supposed to right. go on oh right right okay. you know so we would do whatever we had to do and then you know the second or third day their tour manager came up and goes like you know look you can only play four songs <laughs> and and they were sound checking up until that point i was like come on man this is kind of this sucks and then, you know, so we weren't getting sound checks. We were literally having to figure it out as the doors were opening and do our show. And then it kept progressing over a couple of days. And then one day we started playing one song. We were about to start our second song. And I saw the tour manager on the side of the stage just pull all the faders down and go, like, that's it. Like, you have to cut. And I was, I just literally was like, what? I'm going to kill you now. Like, you know, wow. I'm going to. So I, I don't think he realized who he was dealing with yeah uh, and i just went right at him and chased him out of the venue down the street and this, into the philly philadelphia streets i would have killed him had I oh this was him. philly where were you at tla theater Trocadero? living Arts? what's that Trocadero? Trocadero. Trocadero. yeah yeah Troc. yeah so uh he chased him out of the street down the alley and out never to be seen again uh oh, shit. so i wanted to say very clearly that it was never directly the guys in king's x i mean we never had yeah. any issues, but it was oh, his yeah, tour yeah. manager who was just a nightmare just being such an asshole to us yeah yeah to the point where years later they were on a festival show with us and he hired the police to make sure i didn't kill him no shit <laughs> oh god because uh, he, he was like and they're the guy. nicest guys ty and jerry never just, never assuming chill guys clear about this this was never a doug i don't know if they were aware of what he was doing or how he was treating us or not right but it was progressively getting worse and more and more disrespectful uh, to the point where you just cut us off like a you know a song in and that so this was is 91 90 91 mm-hmm. yep so i'm trying to think of what album they would have had out then it would have been maybe the faith hope and love album or i think it was faith hope and love yeah album. damn man that's crazy so, man and you know in talking to doug and i don't i don't suspect from you i don't get this impression at all but in talking with doug you know doug a couple times said you know you and I both know that King's X is probably one of the most underrated, underappreciated musicians band on the planet. Every right behind, right behind Saigon Kick, I believe. If you right if you're behind doing, Saigon Kick, right, right, exactly. Right. Well, you didn't like, let right. me finish, but that was nipping at our heels, if you'll say. But that's a band that yeah you know, should have been massive, like you guys should have been massive. But they should have been, and I and I've in the interview with Doug, I I could hear. It wasn't bitterness at all. It was just this sort of sadness that it never really got massive, massive. Sorry, because I'm, he sorry, had, I'm sorry to hear he feels that way. What's up? I'm sorry to hear he feels that way. I mean, I look at it kind of the opposite. I mean, I, I am, I've am. i spent my entire life making music not working as a Walmart reader. No, no, he uh, said that. He said, just to be clear, he yeah. said that. What I think, how he prefaced it was like this. He said, I'm, I was great friends with Dimebag and, and, Vinny and Chris Cornell and those guys back in the day. And I saw all those and all those guys were like, Hey, we'll be opening for you and blah, blah, blah. And then I saw all of them jump over me. And it was like, how'd that happen? Because we put these albums out that everyone throws a heap of accolades on, but it didn't happen quite the way that it did for everybody else. But he did say, I never had to work a real job. I never had, I could do whatever the fuck I wanted. And I'm blessed to have done that, you know, because like I said to him, I said, you know, when you see a whole crowd of King's X fans singing Goldilocks back to you and you don't have to sing a word like that's pretty fucking powerful shit right there. Right. It's super. I mean, to, in my mind, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't I don't really subscribe to the underrated thing. I mean, I made a joke about it, but I mean, you wind up where you're supposed to wind up. And I, I mean, I, you know, should I, I just don't think the whole like we should have been bigger. I mean it's like we really touched the group of people we really touched. And, uh, and I mean that of course, musically, of course. Yes. Uh, 
you know, and, and, really? and, and that's something I'm forever thankful to. I'm thankful they're still with me to this day that I can do stuff and they support what I do. Um, you know, I mean, I think you tend to look back, bands become huge for a reason. And doesn't mean you're not good or it doesn't mm. mean you're not, you know, you're not doing cool things or compelling things. But, you know, Metallica is Metallica. And there's a lot of other cool bands of that time. Oh, f- hell yeah. Right. But Metallica is Metallica. And, and there's a reason why they're Metallica. And, you know, and you can go down that list of bands uh, of that time. And uh, I think you ultimately your musical legacy, maybe not at the moment. You know, sometimes you could say, oh, we this could have been bigger right the second. Right. But over time, over time, the quality of what you do winds up being about as popular as it should be. Yeah. And I, I just want to make it clear. Doug never said that's not what he said. I just he, no, no, I, I know what you mean. You know what I mean? He kind of inferred yeah. that, you know, I watched all my friends kind of leap over me and I have moments where I I feel a little sad about that. And that I get that. Yeah, I, if totally. I was him, I'd feel that way too, to an extent, because especially when you got like Charlie Benante and Jerry Cantrell and, you know, uh, Jason Beeler talking about how great you are as a band, you know what I'm saying? And then you see them jump over you. I mean, you're massive stadium level at this point. So, you know, I, you get what I'm saying. I mean, Doug was, so, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I mean, I, I totally understand it. I don't think it's a dumb thing for him to feel. Yeah. I just don't, I just don't tend to look at it that way. You know, I, I yeah. Don't yeah. You're very now. thankful for what, where you're at right Dude, now. Dude, I love making music. I do that every day. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to do things that people that, you know, the level jumps up and the accolades are great and the profile's great and the, and the money. And some days it's not going to connect the way you want it to. Uh, over the course of your life, it's you're going to wind up where you wind up. The reward to me is that I make music. I'm not out doing construction. Not that there's any shame in that. I'm saying like, no, no, of I, could, I could just as easily have to be supporting my family a, a myriad of other respectable ways. Right. Like, so to me, to think of it as anything else other than like this amazing opportunity that I've been given is just so disrespectful because there's a million talented musicians, many way more than me. That never that, get a shot. That never get a shot. Yeah. And uh, so I just don't like to talk about what I didn't get or could have had. That's totally uh, cool, man. I mean, that's a great as much as I want to focus on like what I did get and what right. I am doing. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it, Jason. Um, Real quick, and I don't think you're going to have much to say on this, so I'll just hit it quick, and we'll do these last two questions to do the album stuff. Uh, OG Band reformed in 2012, played some sporadic gigs over the next three or four years. In 2015, looks like the rekindled marriage was just not going to work. Not much to talk about there. It's a done. It's a dead issue. The, right? the way I can phrase it is this. It's like meeting a girl you dated like 20 years ago and you had a really bad breakup with, mm-hmm. and you happen to see her at a hotel convention or whatever. And all of a sudden she walks in and she, you're like, oh, my God, like she looks great. And so you have a little bit of a conversation and you're like, you know, you're starting to think you're like, well, well, she's she's great. Like what what this, what it could have possibly gone so so wrong. Right, right. And you say, well, let's let's meet up for dinner. Yeah. So you, so you get together, you go to dinner and about 15 minutes into dinner, she says something. And you're like, oh, now I know why. Now it's all coming back to me. <laughs> Okay. That's that's the Saigon kick reunion in a nutshell. Fully get it. Fully get it, man. Um, so you don't really have anything to do with any of the guys then, I'm assuming. I still talk to Phil. Yeah. Uh, actually, Jeff Scott Soto, myself, Todd Kearns from Slash's Band and Brent Fitz. Mm-hmm. We just did a show in Vegas together and Phil came up and jammed a bunch of songs. Still talk to Chris all the time. Oh, was was that the what was that for? Was that for the thing that the thing that Paul Stanley was at? No, no, it was it was oh, uh, okay. a months ago. Uh Chris McLernan just did a bass track for me on something for the new record. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really, you know, where it can be civil, I like it to be civil. Cool. Um, two other quick general cues here. Um, what are the things you like to do outside of making music uh, in your in your element? Like, when, what, what are the things you enjoy doing? Love spending time with the family and the dog. And I still try to play ice hockey like two, three times a week if I can. Oh, so that's where those ripped abs came from then. That's where that's yeah. where all the power and explosiveness and sinewy man muscle. And your uh, wife was on board with all the tats then too? She was cool with it? She was remarkably cool with it, yes. <laughs> I have a funny story about that real quick. Go ahead. I wound up doing this prog project with Michael Sadler from Saga, amazing singer. 
We have to talk about Saga real quick at the end of this. Go ahead. So I was so excited. Jonathan Mover, this legendary drummer, who's played with Marillion. Satriani and Merlin. You know, yep. He calls me up, says, I'm doing this prog thing. Michael Savage is going to be the singer. I say, great. I, I'm so a fan of Michael's sing. And that was like the first big MTV band I even remember with like On the Loose. Mm -hmm. So, so good. Michael goes online and says, who's this Jason Beeler guy? And his wife Googles me and pulls <laughs> up the picture that was Photoshopped of me completely ripped Yeah, with like tattoos all over me. Yeah, right. So she goes to him, like, you better get in shape. This guy is, like, unbelievably ripped. He's an animal. And you can't be in a band looking like you look with him. So he's basically going to CrossFit for, like, a month before. And he's a skinny dude. He's a fairly skinny, skinny dude, yeah. dude anyways, yeah. But he's, like, full-on, like, cardio and weightlifting for a month, like, macrobiotic dieting, this whole thing. And I show up at rehearsal, and he's, look, I'm like, what the fuck happened to you? Um <laughs> And it was just like the, when he found out it was a Photoshop, he wanted to kill me. He was oh, like, man. Are you still in touch with him? Yeah. Talk to Michael every once in a while. You got to put a good word in for me, man. I'd love to talk to him. I am a massive Saga fan. Is there a, a more, I know you hate the term, is there a more underrated guitarist than Ian Crichton, man? Holy shit. Uh, that, I still remember that stuff to that to, to this day when I heard that first record. And, and the great thing about Michael is there are guys who become older and they they lose their their abilities a little bit yes. and we still love them. I don't, you know, but if, if I can go see a legend and they're not at the apex of their career, it's a legend. I'm paying my respects. I'm glad to even be in the room with those people. Right. But right. Michael is at the pinnacle of his ability still. And it's just unbelievable to hear that guy saying that uh, guy had as amazing. good as it killer voice back then. And they're still pumping. They're not big in the U S sadly, even though they had the big one hit sort of thing. And there are other songs that they had that were minor hits, but you know, they're fairly big in Canada, I still believe, but they're huge in like Germany and Europe. And, Europe, yeah, yeah, they're they're killing it. and and yeah, you're right, man. What a voice on that dude. And I gotta believe he's probably pushing 70 anyways. I don't know exactly, but he's definitely an inspiration in terms of did you do that project? Is that what is that called? Yeah, I, I did all the rehearsals and get them set up. Uh and we did some promo stuff for them. It's Rio Akamoto too from Spock's Beard is a keyboard player who's just brilliant. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, yep. And then um, I had to do more stuff with my stuff, so they got uh, uh, Mike Keneally, who's again Ugh, crazy good. You don't, yeah, he's just a brilliant player. So uh, I bestowed Zappa, upon right? Mike Keneally. He was in Zappa. He was in, Zappa? he was in Zappa's band. He was in Satriani Dave forever. Bowie? Did some. I don't think he did David Bowie. He did some records with. Uh, Andy Partridge from Ecstasy, though, as well. Right, 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 right. Um, and he did Devin's so, last uh, Empath. He did with. Well, that's Devin. right. He was Devin's musical director, I think. Right. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Um, what's your favorite concert memory that you performed at? Like, what? I mean, it can be the small type junk thing or the giant. It, it's arena. It's got to be the Ozzy Budokan thing, just for a, okay for the life changing thing. You know. And that was sold out, I'm assuming, right? Ozzy tends to be really popular. Yeah, but that was like, like Budokan's what, 12,000, I think? Yeah, so there was two nights yeah. we did pack both nights, yeah. Not and as much with the Pagan Kick fan base, you would think that would have been there, but a lot of Ozzy fans. Yeah, I would imagine. And you said that was Zach on that tour, right? Is that yep. is that the first time you met Zach then, or had you known him yep. before? Or? No more okay. tears. No, I didn't know Zach before that. Uh, Zach's got to be like, the fucking funniest dude in the world to be around, man. Like, just a great dude. I mean, we don't see each other as often, but we cross paths every few years. And uh, you know, I think the I think the world of him is a great dude. Oh, great guy. All right, so I'm gonna hit you with a couple of um, uh, uh, CDs quick, and we're gonna do pass, trash, or treasure. Do you understand the concept? I don't like talking shit about people, so I'll. No, you don't, I'll have, do to, my own you don't have to. If you want to trash it, you can just say trash or pass. Okay. You ready? Yes. What is that? Roxy Music. Uh, is that Avalon? I can't. It is that. Avalon. My, and here's a name dropping Bob uh, Clear Mountain. Yes. Whose mug I am drinking Sweet. from at the moment. That's Sweet. the name of his studio. Uh -huh. uh, I got to do two records with Bob Clear Mountain. And uh, I don't think there's a more talented mix engineer that the world has ever known. So that, that automatically just, you know, if Bob touched it, it's as good as it can be. Do you know that album? Any any of it or I do a couple of songs, yeah. Uh I'm gonna just say it. And I'm not gonna get red in the face or anything. 
Greatest love making album on the planet, right there. That's all I'll say. That's all I'll say. Okay, good. Sorry, I had to bring that up. Hey, yeah, it's fair enough. All right. How about this one? Never heard it. I mean, I'm aware of Jake being brilliant. I think the world of him is a guitar player, but I can't say I'm that familiar with any of the bad you, So you didn't know about Ray Gillen, the singer? Ray Gillen, I knew the name, and I think we were on the same label for a bit. Uh, um, but, Atlantic, yeah, yeah. And yeah, that was Paul, a- that was a Paul O'Neill produced album. So back before kind of it's sabotaged. on me. I know people speak really super highly of it. And again, I, I know Jake's brilliant as a guitar player, just didn't spend much time with that kind okay. of out of my wheelhouse. How about uh, this one here? T- you know, I was I, I'm aware of the TNT uh hits that were big when I was mm-hmm. I this is the first know. album. Well, technically the first wasn't that much of a deep driver, but I've become friends with Tony Harnell since and okay. paid more attention to what he's doing. And what a on, you know, one of the great singers. Ah, oh, amazing. amazing. And L- Ronnie Latecro. The great guitar player. Scary guitar player, man. All right, we're going to get a little funky here. Not funky, rather. Uh, off the beaten path. Can't see it. Uh, Gary pleasure Newman's pres- oh. pleasure principle. Now, my Gary Newman is going to be Cars. Like, that's all I know. Is that on that record? That's on that record. That's, for me, then that's- Gary's kind of the pioneer of the, the you know, Nine Inch Nails, Skinny Puppy, all those guys owe yeah. this guy a huge day. I listen record. to Cars at least once a week. Killer song. He... Jason, yeah. seriously, if you get a chance to see him live, man, now, do it. Don't, don't not go. It. He's absolutely will, fucking amazing live. Yeah. All right. Wonder if you'll know this one. Icon. I know the name, and I know one of the guys is in Phoenix and owns a studio now. I think. That yeah, John Opelino. John. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Yep. Owns an amazing studio out there. I, I, I remember them of the time. But I don't know really the music. Okay, and it's That's on. Fair enough. I'm a terrible human being. No, no, fair enough. We talked about this band and this album in particular exactly. is just, yeah, just a classic. Like I knew a bunch of the songs, like just, but I, again, and this is on me. Like I never really totally deep dived beyond seeing them live, which I thought they were amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, hearing the songs that I had heard, like you know, I I, I need to still to this day go back and listen to. So depth. beyond the out al- the, the songs, and trying to kill their manager, you're not really that aware of them. Over, but look, they went on to a long and prosperous career after I killed their tour manager. So I did them a favor. Had that guy kept acting that way, the band would have been over them. Well, and we'd probably be doing this interview from prison, or you would anyway. Right. So, uh, let's see what you think of this one. Miles Davis. Correct. Sir. Is that Miles Davis? Or can't see. Correct. Yeah. In a silent way. It's a box set. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've been, strangely enough, as a kid, I wasn't a jazz fan, but I've been spending so much time lately listening to Miles, listening to, you know, uh, Charlie Parker, listening to Thelonious Monk, listening to, you know, Coltrane. Uh, all these amazing players and Coltrane and, um, you know, just on and on and on and on. It's just a, it, it, it's like an acquired taste. It reminds me of when I, I never had sushi till I was probably 18 or 19 years old. And at mm-hmm. first I was like, Oh, I don't know if this is really for me. And then you drink a little Sapporo and you have a little more and you're like, this is pretty damn good. And then, right. then you go to Japan and you get hammered and you eat everything coming off the thing. And it becomes like this unbelievable jazz is like that. You have to work. Jazz doesn't you. come to you. You yes. have to invest in jazz. And I the reward is amazing. Fully agree with you. All right, I want to get you out of here under two hours. So how about you mentioned this band ironically and earlier on, and and this is my favorite album of theirs. What do you think of this one? Love? Yeah. The cult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh I th- I th- the songs that I love by the cult are as good as any songs I've ever written. And and that's a band that came from the punk scene and and kind of came up during the new wave scene, I guess you'd almost call it or the early 80s scene. And that album, this album just sounds like no other album, man. It's just, it's, it's they're so, I like they're, they're, electric. They're, they're, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, they're so good. I mean, I, I think, and, and again, those were, you know, there was, I, I really couldn't say, I was. there was a tremendous amount of 80s new wave bands that were like, one, not Flock of Seagulls, who I do like, but oh, it was definitely, like, let me, hit, but let me just put one note and do something annoying. And it was like, it, mm-hmm. you know, it became, there was a lot of the hair metal that happened to the 
80s new wave bands where it just became silly and a parody of itself. Yeah. The Cult and The Cure, there was these bands that came up that the were Cure. so cool and had so much more substance to them. And obviously The Cult's one of those bands. So We just did a, uh, last Saturday night, I did a, a pa full panel deep dive on The Cult where we took every album all the way up through the last one, which was 413 Dream or whatever. And, you know, Disintegration, I mean, I, you can't, <laughs> every band has that seminal album and f you know for you actually it's strange with saigon i could almost you didn't have a lot of albums you had five and we we didn't we skipped album four which i hate to say i'm not as familiar with i need to do that i've read a lot of good things about it it's just by the time water came out i'd started getting into death metal and yeah and uh black metal and things like that and so i was as a constant music seeker i kind of missed that fourth album although i hear it's very good i don't i will i don't know if i should mention the fifth album should we is it you know there it's was fine. A, it, was, it was kind of a yeah that was that just a record fulfill the record contract thing or we were moving i had already figured out we owed another record to uh pony canyon who's a label in japan at the time and we were moving on mm -hmm. i was already starting to do stuff for super transatlantic and it was kind of this it's a it's a kind of transitionary record between i think it probably would have been better suited as a super transatlantic record than a mm -hmm. Saigon kick record more. It was more a focused kind of rock record maybe than right. a, some of the Saigon stuff. But uh, yeah, I, 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 no, I have never, I've never heard it and I've never sought it out, but I am, I'm going to make an admission to you. Um, I have the first album here and I went to dig out my lizard and water copies and I can't find them. I don't know if somebody ripped them off or if I, I, I like to think someone broke into your house in a high tech activity and stole only the Saigon Kick catalog because of its unbelievable value. They did. The they did. And um, I am going to admit to you that I almost lost my life during that break in. So it's a little bit, there's a little bit of a PTSD. I'm I understand. Gonna say, so we're going to leave it there. Um, last album here. And I know you like this one. That's why I pulled it. Oh, Queen Innuendo. Oh, my God. But I got to right. ask you before you go on, before you commit this to, to celluloid or whatever we're on, what about, is this as good or better than Queen 2? Because, man, I struggle between those two. It is my favorite Queen record. Okay. Period. Right. And I actually went to Switzerland and met with a guy who produced that record, whose name, because I'm getting old, is forgetting, I'm forgetting, David, David Richards, Richards, right? David Richards. David, David Richards. Went to the Queen studio that they recorded it in because we were thinking about recording there and actually got to hold the microphone that Freddie sang that last record on. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, but I, I don't think there's a better queen record in my opinion. I think queen. And two I love edges, queen. Queen two edges. It just a bit for me. Cause that's queen's kind of metal right. album with ogre battle and we're done here. No, All saying. right. Hey, it was nice talking to you, bro. <laughs> Can, no, we track, Can we talk about track? We talk about a track or two off here. Sure. Innuendo man, and no. I mean, dude, this album is just, it's, it's amazing. Maybe I, maybe you're changing my mind. I don't know. You know um, those were the days show must go on. Innuendo in and of itself is just innuendos. All you needed is that track. It's incredible. Incredible. And then you got, I'm going slightly mad, which is totally awesome. Brilliant. It's, and you're looking at Freddie and you know, you and I being alive during this period of time and seeing that stuff. And, you know, it's, it's sad. It's, it was brutal because we came through that era of AIDS and the scary stuff that was going on at that time. Cause you never knew what you were. No, when you, when you put it, first of all, it's a brilliant record. If it's, if Freddie's still alive today, it's a brilliant mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. you put the context that of what he was going through and what the band was going through, what they were realizing was happening. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it, it reminds me very much the same way I feel. It, it's a much lighter record, but like David Bowie's Black, Black Star is, is a record that it's, it's it's almost to the point where it's so dark and disturbing when you put it in context uh, that, but what a but way was, to go out as an artist. I mean, if, dude, it was the best thing Bowie had done in years. And I'm a massive Bowie. He's my favorite artist of all time. I mean, just uh, I just went and saw a thing with him. Uh, not with him, with uh, Donnie McCaslin, who plays saxophone on Black Star, and Nate Wood, who was the drummer on Black Star, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the uh, symphony. Yep. They did the whole Black Star record live with the symphony. 
Oh my God, uh, man. And had different singers. It was unbelievable. Yeah, when I heard Black Star, I'm like, and then I think, didn't it come out like a day or two before he died or a day after he died? Right when he died, as far as I knew, like right yeah. after maybe, like it was that week. And I mean, nobody knew, nobody nobody in the general populace knew he was sick like that. And then you, and you're exactly right. It's, it is, they're so comparable. It's crazy because Freddie is making this fully well knowing he's going to die. There was no cure. There was no retrovirals and that kind of stuff. He was too far along. And then they, Bowie's making this album knowing he's got incurable cancer and it turns out to be a seminal piece of work for both these guys. Yeah. People will be chasing that Bowie record f- forever. Trying last to- one. I mean- last one for you, man. You said Jonathan Mover. He was not on this album, obviously. You know, I have to say, I never, I never heard Marillion. What? I've heard of Marillion, but I never, and it's again, like that told you this was going to happen. You were going to get mad at me. Man. Well, Jason, it was a it was a great interview, and you know, Why I don't can't, know can I'm... you just cut it after the Bowie Queen thing? <laughs> Let's... We're live, dude. We're live. This is all out there. When this so, goes up again, just take it off after like. I, I will. I think the I'll, last I'll... good thing I said was they'll be chasing that Bowie record for years. Like, I'll, then... I'll chop it right there. Um, look, man, I want to I want to thank you so much for your you know, the, your gracious time that you put into this. And, um, you know, I'm a small channel. I'm growing and getting bigger and I'm doing a lot of killer interviews. And uh, this was absolutely in that. Well, until the end, it was, it was there, but anyway, um, but I got to say, man, I, I want to wish you and your family happy holidays and, um, right back at you in your honor, sir. I am going to, after we get off here, I'm going to, well, that didn't come out right after we end the stream. Uh, I'm going to play Fuck You, It's Christmas in honor of your musical genius. Thank you. And I'm much. going to do that at my family's Christmas get-together this weekend. But I, I need some information from you, if you don't mind. Sure. I need to know the phone number and name of your attorney because I'm going to have to probably think about legal proceedings because of the uh, psychological. It's going to save you a lot of money on food uh, because a lot of people are going to leave. So it's going to really, I mean... Well, no, I'm thinking about the psychological trauma that my mother will put me through when I play that song for her. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's it's a hit or miss crowd with that one. You gotta, you know, dude. I saw that. I'm like, come on, man, really? And I listened to that this morning. I'm like, that is just exactly in my wheelhouse, man. So, but again, thank you so much, and I hope dude, thank uh, you so much for taking the time. You put together a bunch of great questions. Good luck with the channel. Yeah. I had a blast. I hope I hope I answered the questions you were looking for, and. Uh, you kicked Again, ass, man, so and I out. apologize for interrupting. Sometimes I get very excited, uh-huh. and I want to get to that next thing. And this was a killer, killer interview, dude. And uh, I, I may hit you up again about Mike Sadler if I – Please, please. Be happy to and Devin, for that matter. I mean, Devin – I know Devin a little bit. I've met him a couple times, and uh, we actually have something very much in common. Uh, when he was opening for – not opening for when he was with Steve Vai – and they did the Sex and Religion album. They went to Hammerjacks, and I went and saw them there. Dev climbed up. Remember how that had like a second tier around it with, yep, the, like the the I don't know what you want to call it, the Iron Lung Bannister or whatever. Dev climbed up on top there as Steve was doing you know his Steve thing, and he's just coming over and he did this, and I was pretty probably loaded, and we fucking head butted so hard that I'm pretty sure I still have that concussion from that that night 40 years ago or whatever it was so but yeah man i mean yeah well, good I'm, luck with your good luck with your recovery we're getting there i figure by the time i'm 75 or so i'll be fully recovered so all right man hey thank you so much jason it was awesome thank man. you my friend have right, a great one take, take care, care man see ya all right that was awesome man thanks to jason thanks to the i don't know eight ten people that were on tonight or this afternoon, I should say. And everybody have a Merry Christmas because this is probably it until after the uh, after the holiday. And see you guys around later.